When man created the first rule, he undoubtedly created the first loophole. Just as when the first story was ever told, the first plot hole was born. Well, enough of this intro. It's time to fill you in. Let's throw ourselves into the fryer as loopholes and plot holes get deep, fat, fried. Welcome to Deep Fat Fried. Oh, yeah, it's the greatest podcast of all time, starring TJ and others, including um, uh, Beard Guy and other TJ, smaller TJ. Other TJ? Yeah. S- smaller, smaller, more attractive TJ. Beard Guy and smaller TJ and TJ on the show called Deep Fat Fried. This is a holy episode, right, Scotty? It's a very holy. A lot of this holes. Is the holiest episode you've ever seen. Of this oh show. yeah. And there's plenty of other holes. Good mm. dive deep. Here. Oh yeah, I love them holes, bro. Oh, yeah, I bet you guys love holes. Oh yeah, I love them holes, Paul. Hey, let me ask you a question, Paul. If you had to fuck either a loophole or a plot hole, which hole would you fuck, Paul? Probably a plot hole. Because the loophole sounds like it would be it would like chafe you. Yeah. Plus, it could tighten at any minute. Plot holes only ever seem to get wider, which that might not be pleasing, but a loophole could tighten up to the point where it's uncomfortable. Like, it could tighten up to where your dick is basically, yeah. like, you know, strangulated I'm and shit. To, I feel like trying you were like my cock, you know, first and foremost. I mean, like, it's like you ever see what happens when, when, when dogs fuck, dude, that your dick gets like stuck. The loophole could be like that. Yeah. You ain't getting out of that. You think, you think you're, you're in fucking for a good time? Nope. You ain't getting away. Nope. Better off fucking the plot hole, even though it could get bigger and just not be very pleasing to fuck. But, you know, what you, you got to do? do what you got to do, TJ. You yeah, gotta fucking do. you got to do what you got to fucking do, Scotty. You ain't got to tell well, me, yeah, fucking Scotty. Hey, Scotty, shut the fuck up. Hey, 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 hey. No, no, shut quiet, up, Scotty. TJ. Shut quiet, the TJ. fuck up. TJ, quiet. TJ, TJ, TJ. I know you're on a diet, so you're cranky, buddy. He's hangry. TJ, I know, look, I know you're hungry. I know you're probably thinking of that grilled cheese burrito from Taco Bell. I'm trying to fucking talk here, and you're fucking interrupting me. This is my episode, Scotty. Let me tell you about the oh, fucking... Oh, shit, it is? Okay. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Let me tell you about the fucking loophole here. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you know what? If you want to take over, TJ, I'm fine with that. Go ahead. Hell yeah. All right, so a loophole is a noun, right? A noun. Yeah, Do you guys know what a noun is? It's a, a woman. Per- it's a woman who works at a convent. That's right. Very good, Paul. Mm. <sighs> okay, so uh, loophole. Definition of loophole. Wait, can I ask a question? No. Why does Why does the no. TJ show suck so bad? Why is this sucking so bad? No. Uh, you know why? Because I'm because I'm saddled with I'm saddled with two fucking morons. Is why, Paul. That's why the TJ show sucks. Because TJ is fucking sandwiched between two morons. I can't TJ. feel free to be if, myself if, if we're here. We're a bunch of sa- saps and morons and dupes. You're sandwiched between dupes, buddy. So but I made myself a little challenge. I'm like, oh, you know what? I bet you I'm so good I can fucking climb to the top of the fucking YouTube <laughs> shit heap, even with these two shackled around me. And so far, I overestimated myself. 
but whatever. Loophole. Okay. Definition. I'm gonna drag TJ's camera so that he's bottom bitch. <laughs> well, I'm and, top bitch in my fucking uh, well, I'm, canonical I'm one. Put a note to Taylor on the one that I upload. No, to say, no, 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 no. One. This is the one. No, that's not the one, Paul. Episode. You're bottom bitch, TJ. Oh uh, hell no! Center, at, front and center, of course, is Scotty, who's actually going to run a watchable episode in it. Instead of just like two hours of TJ rambling in this horrible New York accent, he's he's affected. For this show, what you know, horrible you know, you know, you know, you know, is that's how I fucking talk. Me, fuck the TJ. That's it's how I Martin. fucking talk, eh? Talk like that, TJ. Yeah, I fucking talk like that, eh? 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 Pardon me, I am Eric Defeden. <laughs> <laughs> I am greatest political character now, of all You're time. I am the depths, Eric yeah. Defend, the yoga. <laughs> <laughs> The people, the Swedish people meatball. Clamor. Yeah, the people still clamor for Eric the Fed, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I still get, I still get, I still well get requests, him, dude. I still, I still get requests to this day for Eric the Fed, dude. Someone's like, "Hey, could you sing a manatee song?" And they're like, "No, no, 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 fuck that." What we really want you to do is Eric the Fed, Paul. Dude, I sent you a pretty good manatee song the other day. You did. Oh yeah, that's true. What was it? I you guys didn't even comment on it. Nobody even mentioned the beauty of the fucking manatee song. Because you weren't singing it, Paul. That's the problem. Mm. Yeah. Yes, so indeed. Like that, so that's the issue, man. Like reading the song, it sounds good, but like so there's no performance to it. So you're kind of just like, yeah. eh, good lyrics. Good. It's good. good. Anyway, Scotty, tell us about fucking loopholes, eh? Eh. Eh. Uh, I thought you were taking over the episode for me. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were dropping that. Uh, okay, so loophole. Definition one, a means of escape. <sighs> definition two, A, a small opening through which small arms may be fired. Definition two, B, or not to be, a similar <laughs> opening to admit light and air or to permit observation. <laughs> All right, TJ. Good job. Ride tonight. It's been a great one. Thank you, TJ. All right. That was a that was a rough one, but uh, I'm glad we got through it. We got through it. We plowed through it somehow. All right, Scotty, go ahead. It's a lup hole, dude. Lup hole. So basically, it's getting out of shit. You made a fucking agreement or a bet or whatever it is, and you find a loophole. Here's Urban Dictionary's definition, which I have to say, I'm disappointed. Disappointed, dude. A forgotten condition in law agreement, etc., that allows one to interpret and, in conclusion, get around another condition. An example they have is Dave. Man, I hate that fucking uh, fuck. I fucking hate that bitch. Joe, calm down. You know we're not allowed to hit girls. Who said anything about hitting? There's no rule against brutally beating with a medieval flail. Evil glint. Who pulls rule? And Joe, you sick fuck. Sorry, that's this wow. one's not good. Urban Dictionary. Oof. Oof. Urban yeah, Dictionary. Urban Oof. Dictionary. We need yeah, a, that's, uh, an update to the loophole article stat. Yeah. Wow. Uh, hey, guys, anyone out there? If you guys are looking for your time to shine on Urban Dictionary out there, <laughs> this, this, one is, it. this one this one needs a fucking makeover. Yeah, we believe in you people. We fucking believe in you. I mean, this only has 182 upvotes and 49 downvotes. Yeah, I mean, there's an opportunity here to make your mark on the internet. Yeah, this one sucks, bro. Fuck Oof. it, dude. Oof. Fuck it. We're Oof, done with I it. say. Oof. Look at this nice little loophole right here, TJ. Wow. Maybe I do want to fuck the loophole. Yeah, I was just about to say, Paul, maybe you made the wrong choice. Now I'm looking at it. Now I'm getting a good look. Yeah, I mean, uh, oof. Damn, I mean, uh, whew. Good gander. I mean, it might be a little rough, mm. but, uh, you know, I don't know. Mm. Mm. Uh. Mm. So, I'll give you the actual, I think, a way that explains it. A loophole is an ambiguity or inadequacy in a system, such as a law or security, means stocks, which can be used to circumvent or otherwise avoid the purpose implied or explicitly stated of the system. Uh, there actually was an original. I guess I didn't actually pull it. <laughs> idiot, but the, the actual arrow slit, which is what it used to be known as, a narrow vertical window in a wall which through an archer could shoot. So that was a little cool thing. Uh, I think she 
I'm not going to bother dragging it in. But yeah, so actually it had an original meaning as something else. One of the things that changed. Of course, I figured this would be a good one to pull. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Shouldn't, shouldn't this be full of like conservative propaganda and then have, have some other dude's name on it? Libs owned. Oh, yeah. Lib nuts. Yeah, that was the fucking thing. Yeah, yeah, what's the dude's name? Um, I think it was Lib nuts. I forget what the well, name I mean, of the like, dude who the makes it. Name, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Who cares? We're the only one who pays attention to that fuck. And even then, only on occasion. Uh, so but if you're I, listening, it's uh, number one. Explain Newton's first law of motion in your own words. And like and Calvin's Calvin there looking at the, the paper all stressed out. Like, oh, my God, I don't know what the fuck. Yeah. Then he gets a big smile on his face. Yeah, I got some idea. Food, mog, grug, pabba wop, zinc, watum, gazork, chumble, spuzz. <laughs> and Calvin's leaning back in his chair. I love loopholes. Ah, uh, in your own words. The loopholes are basically what TJ employs anytime that he said he was going to do something, but then it didn't get done. Yep. Yes. And so there's always a, well, I was going to do that, but there was some extenuating circumstance. So unfortunately, I was oh, unfortunately, unable I, to comply. I was unable to comply. It's beyond just an extenuating circumstance. It's like, Re, it's like you you read something as more like what's Calvin's doing here is he's taking this more right. he's like using the literalistic nature of the fucking you know to like get around it right he's going he's like, obeying the letter of the law so closely that he fucking avoids having to obey the spirit I exactly. said be done Saturday I didn't say which Saturday right uh, shit like that that is true. Or it's like if there's something against hitting a woman, but there's nothing against beating her with a flail. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, fucking Urban Dictionary. Come on. I'm sorry. I'm still stuck on that. that was I awful. know. That was really bad. Like, I even wrote that. I'm like, whoa, Urban Dictionary, you fucking you failed me. Like, I feel betrayed. It was brutal. Yeah, so oh. I figure the first section of the show should be everyone's favorite mm. corporate loopholes. It's my favorite kind of loophole. I mean, who doesn't love these? You can make that bigger. Oh, I, could I, TJ? Yeah, because it's pretty small. Yeah, there we How's go. That, TJ, is that good? That's delicious. It's good enough for you, TJ? Yep. So you know what, TJ? People always want corporations to pay their fair share. But let's be real. No matter what anyone says, they're always looking for loopholes to pay less taxes or to get around pesky rules and regulations. I mean, no one likes to do this. And of course, if you're rich, TJ. Fuck, I hate rules and regulations. There's lots of exceptions for you. Yeah, rules and regulations suck. I mean, no one likes rules and regulations, right, TJ? Yeah, you? not me. Yeah, I figured you'd be on board with that. Definitely not TJ. He hates the rules. How about tax havens and transfer pricing, guys? So multinational corporations don't have to pay taxes on overseas profits. That is, until they transfer those profits back home to the U.S. of A., this would make sense if it weren't known for a practice known as transfer pricing, where a multinational corporation can transfer the profits of a U.S. subsidiary to a subsidiary, say, in the Cayman Islands. There, the money sits allowing corporations to defer taxes on those profits indefinitely. By its own accounting, the U.S. government loses around $10 billion every year to this loophole. Hmm. It's probably way more. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that's, that's what they actually can feasibly estimate. Let me see companies here. Which companies have the most tax havens? For some reason, one of the biggest financial companies in America, Goldman Sachs, they have 905 as of 2017. Wow, they Damn. blow away the competition when it comes to that shit. Morgan Stanley, another big financial company, 619. Wow. It's kind of crazy. They got a lot of these, these companies in tax havens. Wow. Well, that's, that's, well, you know what, guys? It's not all bad. How about antitrust loopholes? Because, you know, right, like, like, hey, the two companies are going to merge, but the government's got to look at the deal and make sure the deal's okay, right? They got to make sure the deal's all right. So, ordinarily, when one big company acquires another, they have to notify the Department of Justice, which decides if the merger violates anti-monopoly regulations. However, oh, however, companies can avoid these regulations if the, if the company they buy uh, that is both foreign and itself owns less than seventy million dollars in U.S. assets, so up to seventy million dollars. So that so when, for example, when Google bought Israeli-based Waze, which is like a GPS software, 
for over $1 billion last June, uh, which was considered to be Google's real competition in the development of mapping software. Many people are like, hey, what the fuck? This is one of the major players in the market. Or according to existing law, the Justice Department couldn't touch them. Uh, so they went, so uh, another fucking hole in it. So first off, they don't have to they can keep their profits overseas. If you buy another company, oh, you're right, there's some regulatory process that ensure they don't have a monopoly. Oh, they bought the company overseas too. And they didn't have any U.S. assets. So if a company was to do that, they could just have $70 million in assets and then Google or whoever could buy them <sighs> without any regulatory scrutiny. How about punitive uh, damage deduction? So the company gets sued. The company does something bad and they lose. So an ordinary person gets a speeding ticket. They don't get to write that off as a tax deduction at the end of the year. Right? Right. Yeah. You don't get to do that. If you get a speeding ticket or something happens to you, it's like if Paul, you know, gets sued and he has to pay a judgment, he doesn't get to go and say, oh, this is a tax deduction for me. It's like, nope, he has to deal with it. You guys will love this. When corporations are found criminally liable, so think about all the times we've heard this company's been hit with a big fine and hit with punitive damages. They get to claim those damages as a, quote, necessary and ordinary business expense. Awesome. <laughs> so well, we hear about this company being punished they're actually being rewarded but of course <laughs> so for example well, I mean hey if you gotta pay a fine every now and then I mean that's part of doing business and you know that should be right offable on the taxes why shouldn't they be rewarded for their <laughs> hard work killing people yeah of course you know I mean it's hard, all in day's work right so for example Exxon's 1.1 billion dollar fine for the Valdez oil spill end up costing the company less than half that figure after taxes. Essentially, taxpayers are left picking up the rest of the tab. Thank God. <laughs> so ExxonMobil fucking has a nat it causes a basically a natural disaster. It ends up getting a tax break because of it. Because we're there <laughs> to say we're we're there to bail them out, as usual. Yeah. All right, guys, you fucked up, but don't worry. The American taxpayer is here to help. Uh, how about patent injunctions, TJ? I don't know. How about them? How about them, TJ? How about them? Oh, I don't know. Right? I don't know shit about them. Like a boring thing. Who cares? Patent injunction? Like, well, I don't yeah, know it's, it's, my eyes kind of glaze over even at the mention. Like, oh, uh, patent injunctions. Of course. Uh, I, uh, all these giant companies can get away with it because you hear that and the American public hears patent injunctions. Their eyes roll back to their head permanently and they go fucking brain dead. Can't blame them. It's not an interesting subject, but that's what these companies do. So, patent injunctions are corporates, are corporations' favorite tools for bullying and intimidating rising competitors. Ideally, when a patent holding corporation believes another company's product is violating their copyrights, they can ask a judge for an injunction, essentially blocking the the violator from selling the infringing product. However, because injunctions were so easy to get in many cases, corporations were using the mere threat of one to force smaller companies into shelving their products or paying them exorbitant fees even when they only had a weak claim of copyright infringement that could even be made. Yeah, because uh, the claim the, might be weak, but the corporate lawyers are strong. Uh, yes, very strong. Uh, when the Supreme Court rewrote the rules to make injunctions harder to get, many thought the loophole was closed. But when the government closes the door, corporate lawyers open a window. Yes, TJ, you, so you are correct. Instead of going through the courts, corporations are now going to the U.S. International Trade Commission. Ah, you gotta love them. You gotta love them. You close one door, they open a window. I love it. I love it. Hey, but guys, remember, the government got fucking tough. We got regulations. Unleashing the dog of re dogs of regulation. Look at them. They're toothless. <laughs> yeah, I love it. A couple of Severus is there, man. Like they just look so intimidating. I, I just like look at them, guys. There's no way they got everything a dog to. needs except teeth. A, a minor, a minor detail, TJ. I love how the bank lobby is there in the background with, with the fucking teeth laughing like <laughs> we have successfully removed all of the important parts of this legislation. It may go forward now. Oh, no, the dog has gummed us. What shall we do? <laughs> uh. The only thing I don't like about this uh, this political cartoon is that uh, it makes it look like they like got one over on Obama, who was like genuinely trying to do something. 
right. instead of Obama just like laughing with the guy and like winking at him or something. Yeah, it was just too great not to pull. But yeah, I can see that interpretation. So you guys remember the uh, Volcker rule, the Locker rule? Excuse me. Um, I was I a big thing that was debated about a bunch. I don't. I, Shamefully enough, I don't. Maybe Paul does. I don't. Uh, it was okay. So the Volcker rule, a provision the Dodd Frank bill that aims to finally get commercial banks out of the risky trading business, was meant to finally clamp down on the kind of financial practices that led to the Great Recession in about 2008. Uh, well, that was the idea behind the rule anyways. Uh, now it's been watered down by lobbyists, big banks. will have plenty of at loopholes to access. The biggest loophole seems to be the exemption allowing banks to buy government debt. Although there's no danger when banks buy relatively low-risk tre- treasury bonds, uh, they are free to bet your money in de- on Detroit and Puerto Rican debt, which you know isn't so secure. So they can actually still keep b- making these risky bets. Doesn't matter. There's a, a loophole in, in that. And there's another one, which is actually called is actually the foreign bank exemption. Which this one's crazy. Uh, so one of the financial sector's loudest arguments against the Volcker rule was the restriction against proprietary trading reduced U.S. banks' competitiveness uh, uh, vis-a-vis foreign banks. Like there's like so basically they're saying like, hey, foreign banks can do whatever. They're not hamstrung by these rules like we're gonna be. So thanks to lobbying, however, they want an exception. Banks under the uh, Volcker rule can now do all the risky trading they want as lo- uh, so long as it's through their, quote, foreign banking en- entities. Where, all they, where, where they have all their money. Yeah. So it's just like, okay, you can just keep doing it, but you got to do it from a different terminal. <laughs> yeah. Do, 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 do. Uh, it was explained, I, I read uh, uh, larger articles on this, was just basically like that. Okay, so we'll make that decision in our office in London. So the London office decided to do all this stuff that we're not allowed to do here. So it's okay, and we, and we can keep doing it. By the hey, way, hey, hey, hey! You can't sell crack on this street corner. You got to go over there and sell it on that street corner. <laughs> <laughs> that's yep. basically what I got. No, that's exact. I mean, it's not even that. I mean, for these companies, it's not even a problem. It's it's a it's a simple shift in accounting. It's like oh. Oh, okay. All right. We're not allowed to do this anymore. So our uh, subsidiary in Ireland is the one making the bets now. How yeah. About that? yeah, the Irish so, branch does that. So uh, wh- the, the question becomes, why are foreign uh, arms of corporations allowed to make bets on our national stock market? Why is any foreign entity allowed to run up or run down a stock. Doesn't that seem like a dangerous? Because Paul, I mean, but think about this, the scary world. So these other banks, these other countries, they'll beat America and we won't be number one anymore. So these big bankers are scared. And the only way they can feel safe is they have to have an exemption from these regulations that will stifle competition and hurt them. It's, It's a fucking joke, dude. It's just like, okay, so you want to put these rules in, so let's just make a fucking whatever exemptions we have. So the rules don't even apply. So there's no point even having these rules. These rules are all for show. This rule might not might as well not even exist. <laughs> like, I mean, like what they've uh, as much as they've watered it down, it might as well not even exist. Here's another great one. You guys will like this one. How about carried interest? Here, this is a great corporate scam. So some hedge fund managers and corporate CEOs manage to pay drastically lower taxes on their income. By calling it something else, carried interest. Uh, and carried interest, uh, which refers to the return on a, a predetermined profit, allows these executives to claim their compensation as capital gains and not income. Of course, and capital gains, of course, the reason for that is, are tax lower to encourage investment and stimulate economic growth. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so stimulating. Uh However, for corporate executives who are compensated mainly through stock options and carried insurance, it's a loophole that lets them pay half of what they would otherwise owe to the IRS. So they get a 50% saving on their tax bills. Yeah, and that's why you see, if you go look at the salaries of most CEOs, you'll see that they're paid, like, tremendously in stock. Oh, yeah, Steve Jobs famously, I'm only paid a dollar. Right. And it's yeah. a combination of these loopholes that Scotty's describing that allow rich people to pay effective zero tax rates and shit. Yeah. 
defer their taxes inevitable or uh, indefinitely and fucking you know what i mean they there there's just a billion of these little fucking weaselly language based kind of workarounds that they work into legislation or work into fucking uh, litigation that allows them to basically do whatever they want listen if, if something almost destroys the world and everybody that understands it or comes to understand it realizes it has to stop, but they want to keep doing it. They just fabricate a fucking way to do it overseas. It's the same thing. It's literally the same thing. The transaction is coming from a different bank now. Yeah. They literally either just like, okay, well, look, uh, we can't do that anymore. Okay. Well, can, uh, can our branch in, uh, you know, in the Netherlands do it? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, that that's fine. Ireland is a total haven for this type of shit. Yeah. Or uh, uh, Irish branch is the one that's making the risky bets now. And by the way, because these loopholes have been allowed to remain wide open and gaping, even despite the fact that they almost ended the world back in 2008, we are now uh, wearing a rusty pair of ice skates standing on the edge of an icy frozen waterfall once again. Um you know what I mean? And tottering towards the fucking edge with nothing to grab onto. And if Once it's not, again, if it's not just a matter of changing the location, then it's a matter of just changing the word. Yeah. Just call it something else. Right. It's capital gains. Yeah. You change the word or you change yeah, the location right. and all of a sudden it's different. We knock 50% off of it with the capital gains and then we move it to our Irish division and we make you a, you know, a primary employee of that division. So you defer your taxes here. So the other 50% is deferred to your Irish taxes, which are far lower. And then, but by the time those come due, we're going to move the money to the Czech Republic where the effective tax rate is the same, but it'll allow you to defer your Irish taxes. And then we're going to move the money to you know, the Cayman Islands where there's a 0% tax rate. And by the time the tax bill comes due, there's no money in any of these banks. So you don't owe anything. There you go. Everything just moves yeah. around. Technically, you didn't make anything. Yep. <laughs> like, isn't it great? Not in America. You made a lot of money in the Cayman Islands somehow, though. You're raking in billions down there. But here in America, somehow Coke made no money. And that's oh. why you hear all these stories all the time about, oh, well, you know, uh, General Electric ba- paid nothing in taxes or Amazon paid, you know, nothing in taxes or on mobile. Yeah. Like you hear about all these giant mega corporations turning around billions and billions of, of dollars in profit, and then they pay nothing in taxes. And this is why, because there's like endless loopholes these motherfuckers can use and exploit. And they do, and they use. How many loopholes do you guys have to do? Does the does the common person have in their life? You know, where they no, can I mean, just fucking like, oh, here. never mind. I'll just. You might find a shady accountant. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that's willing to fucking walk the line there's or whatever. definitely i will say this there's definitely loopholes that the average american can take advantage of not like, like this, this though like this no god it's like there's like some little known like tax refundable tax credits or something that people might qualify for or, or tax breaks that they <laughs> might get but they're not getting shit like oh you know by the way you're gonna pay half of your income uh like you're gonna say 50 percent of your income tax bill if you even pay a cent to begin with and let's be honest these guys aren't paying shit if they're paying anything it's it's just for show like oh okay yeah i want to pay this. Or it's fucking it's it's made up in fucking deductions or whatever the fuck it is they end up you know the like, uh there was a guy um i forget who it was it was some writer i forget which writer it was but he basically tried he basically made the case to the irs that every single expense in his life was a business expense he's like because it's all i just i write my what i know i write my life and every time they would challenge something, he'd like write like a little poem or essay or something about it. And it'd be like, see, uh, but that's about the, that's about the smallest person I've heard finding a loophole, like well, on dude, this level. You could, I mean, this, most of these places I've seen documentaries on this stuff. Like you can pay like 1500 bucks to some company, like any of us could to the Cayman Islands and say, okay, deep pet fried is now based in the Cayman Islands. And our money, yeah, our money goes all through the Cayman we Islands. Now. Away with it, though. We would be popped immediately. Oh, by of course. Democrats, and they'd be like, what the fuck do you think you're doing moving to the Cayman Islands? Don't you know that you have to go through Ireland, Czechoslovakia, and fucking North Africa first, you dumb fucks? You skipped, you, you, you tried to skip to the final loophole. You got to jump through all the other ones first, and that means you got to have millions of dollars of assets, which means you're fucked. Your little Cayman Island game is over. 
Yeah, most people, you know, open their little Swiss bank account like, hoo hoo. It's like, nope, you're now on a government watch list. You're getting all this bullshit. But if you're some rich fuck like this with a million lawyers who found every legal loophole imaginable, you somehow can skirt it. You're not even legally tied to that money by the end of it. No. Well, it's all it's all a business asset anyways. Like most most of the wealth is held in businesses and you know securities and shit. It's not held by these actual people. Right. I mean, that's that's something that like I it took me a long time to realize because I'm not real good with money even to this day. But like one of the hard won lessons of money was that um uh, like money begets money. Like the more you got of it, the more you have of it. Because in order to make it, you have to you have to use it to make more, you know what I mean? And that's, oh, yeah. uh, that's a basic principle of money that I, I think a lot of people don't understand. And these, and these corporations clearly understand that. I mean, anything that they spend, like they could, they, they might spend $60 million on building fucking, you know, facilities or upgrading facilities or whatever. And you might look at that and go like, wow, look at them reinvesting in the fucking, but really they're just doing that for the tax deferment so that they don't, right. They get the benefit of having state of the art factories and they don't, they pay zero effective tax rate. Exactly. And because, like, it's a great, it's a, it's like the corporate system in America is like just the greatest scam. If you're a large company, it's like just like a white fucking dream. It's like, oh my God, I've reached the promised land. I can literally do whatever I want. You have got a golden fucking ticket. Just like, what's our tax bill going to be this year? Probably like, you know, 60 million. All right, well, let's reinvest 60 million into the corporation and reap the benefits of that and pay nothing. Okay. What's great, dude, Paul, is then let's say you're some big company and you do that. And you ha- so you want people to work at that building. So you hire a bunch of people in whatever town. And then suddenly, oh, uh, we want to do this. We want to tax you. Oh, that's a bad idea. Oh, well, we have, oh, well, we want to tax you. Oh, well, we have 5,000 employees in the area. You know, suddenly it's like, do we really want to do that? Oh, let's just give him a pass. He's yeah, we, you know what? We pull up stakes and move down to Mexico if you'd like and leave all these people <laughs> jobless in your little shit town. It's like they got you by the balls. It's like, okay, I guess you can just. Yeah, don't pay those taxes. Yeah, no taxes. Fine. I think we're all well versed in this one. Uh, unlimited anonymous campaign donations. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Many people already know super PACs are fucking bullshit. They're they're horrible. But they're the loophole that allows people to get around this this uh, donation limit shit. Well, here's here's the great part about it. Uh, for a brief moment, there was a silver lining because super PACs would be required by law to reveal their donors. So if one extremely wealthy individual or corporation tried to say out you know outright just go buy an election, you know. The a public would at least have some knowledge. Like it has to be reported. Like Michael Bloomberg is putting five billion dollars behind Donald Trump or whatever, or fucking Joe Biden or wh- whoever George Soros. That is until corporations found a loophole. They realized that they that basically if you put the money and the donations through a five hundred one c four quote social welfare organizations, they are not required to make their donors public. Right. So all they've got to do is just tap dance around the language and reclassify their organization so that it looks like it's for social benefit. Yes. And then just appropriate endless amounts of money to candidates and basically do exactly what these laws are designed to prevent, which is per- the purchasing of politicians. Because what do you think this represents? Like When you see this green bar in 2018 and you look up there and he says, OK, super PACs. Yep. That- you know who's buttering the bread now. So the party and the super PACs, this is why Bernie Sanders will never be at the head of the Democratic ticket. This is why he was doomed from the very first day that he announced that he was going to run as a Democrat. And this is why his campaign was never going anywhere because look at who butters the fucking bread. Super PACs, anonymous giant corporate donors, and the party which is funded by what giant anonymous corporate donors. Holy fucking shit. I think I found a loophole guys. (laughs) I think I found a way that we can make it actually legal. Hold on guys. It's 2008 and I'm having an idea. All right. We've gone back in time. It's 2008. I've got a fucking idea. You know what sucks TJ? What sucks? Deep fat fried can't own a politician. (sighs) Yeah, that's true. 
I mean? There's all these regulations. I mean, yeah, we can have the party, like we can donate to the party, but there's so little influence with the party. You know, it seems like these politicians are going yeah, off. What we rail. need is a fucking politician that's just for us. Yeah. That'll like just totally vote every way that we would want and introduce legislation that would just benefit us like streamers and video content creators on YouTube pay zero t- in taxes, you know, because they're providing a, a free public uh, entertainment benefit. Wow. You know That's I mean? a brilliant idea. Yeah. Fast forward to 2018, boys. We're in the money. <laughs> <laughs> we're making a billion dollars a year doing nothing. <laughs> Hey, everybody, it's Deep Fat Fried again, blah, 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 whatever, you know. We own half of Washington. It's just like if people boo us, we can literally have them subpoenaed. You know what I mean? Like trolls in our chat are are routinely getting subpoenas. Uh, Why did you make the defamatory comment on August 28th of 2019, sir? You said, fuck this show. It sucks. Do you think that that had some damage? Implicitana, do you think that somebody might have read that and gotten the wrong idea about the hard work that these gentlemen do? <laughs> All right. We so now I know what the, uh, the my my uh, Baron Stang universe is. Yep. We got to get this. We're, we need to buy a politician. Yeah, let's hurry up and do it. But yeah, yeah. Look, Citizens United decision. We could probably been, afford like a mayor or something at this point, right? I mean, I'm fucking idea and the economic smarts to put together the hedge funds to get the initial capital to start a super PAC. If we'd have had this fucking idea, then we could be in it. But now we're bought out. Yeah. Like the, the, the buy-in on this is too high. We, we don't have the money anymore. We don't have the capital. Like we, if we'd have mastered that shit in 2008, if we'd have seen this fucking shit coming, man. All right. What we got to do is move to us. Look, here's what we got to do. We move to a small town, not too small, but you know, small enough we buy the mayor right then we funnel all the tax resources from that town to ourselves Uh then we go to a bigger town buy a bigger mayor we keep climbing up the ladder of mayors so we can buy ourselves a fucking state senator somewhere see the problem is is that somewhere between buy a mayor and buy the next mayor the feds would be at our doors with the IRS and every fucking arm of the federal government, because you know what? We're not part of the power structure. We're not allowed to play that game. <sighs> See, you're trying to start the super PAC scam again. You can't do that. It's already running and it's legal and legitimized now, TJ. And right. you can't be a part of it because you don't have the buy-in. So you don't get to go. Well, I'm going to say we'll use the system. We'll use well, we'll TJ, look, do, we'll do everything in conjunction with the super bet, PAC TJ, system. It's just become a, is, is look, TJ, just become a what? shell. Just become a shell, TJ, and then you can be the face of one of these super PACs. Well, look, I don't want to become a face of a super PAC. We want we just start up a super PAC. The feds aren't. Well, look, you, you used your experience and connections with that, TJ, to start your other super PAC. Neckbeard uh, pack. Yeah, neckbeard pack. Maybe we can just get a bunch of people to join our super PAC. It'd be like, we're we're a super PAC, you guys. We're gonna fucking get some politicians that fucking pursue no, the interests of the neckbeards. One three C, TJ. We're a nonprofit for general welfare. Yeah. Corporation. To the, the advance the neck beard cause. With, and then then at that point we will join together with several other non for profit corporations to facilitate the super PAC, which will allow unlimited donations. We could just run through. the Anita Sarkeesian scam and say, you know, we're we're look look, we're a non profit educational institution, y'all. Yeah. If, yeah. if I mean we could look we could literally just say that it's for social benefit. Yeah. We yeah. could. Yeah, I mean, we're little, we guys, we literally could do like that. Like, this is how fucked up the system is, and I guarantee you, with that, as long as we follow the rules of that, we would basically get away with it. Oh yeah, I mean, Anita Sarkeesian's been getting away with it for fucking years. Of course she has. You know, and all she has to do is file. Like, I think it's like a form nine ninety or eight ninety. So there's some fucking form they have to file, and that's all you got to do is you have to file one disclosure form per year. I'm a non for profit. Here's a picture of me in the Cayman Islands on a fucking ninety foot <laughs> yacht having grapes fed. Well, it's basically like if you go look into the finances of her company, like she basically, she raises a shit ton of money from people claiming like, I need money to fucking do this thing. But if you go look at the only thing is she has to publish her finances. So you can go look at them and you can see like, why does she, why is she, why are you raising money? You have half a million dollars in this nonprofit already. That was a crazy thing. You don't need any more. And then you see like, and, but it's like she can pay herself whatever she wants. Be like, I only made this much, but she has access to all the money in that nonprofit at any time. 
Right. And, and she, she can, can at any time from- go like, yeah, I'm fucking uh, this year. I paid my like when basically when her scam is all said and done and she doesn't have to fucking it has no eyeballs on her anymore. Or the she just doesn't care. A lot of nonprofits. Do you think I have a feeling that they're in private residences? So oh, yeah. You could buy things for yourself and then just say, hey, this is just for upgrading the headquarters of the nonprofit, dude. But you can oh, pay yourself too. You. I mean, like she paid like she paid herself like uh, 30,000 or something, but she has all that money in there. I needed one of those fucking big ass curved Samsung monitors in every room hanging on the wall perfectly. And I needed a comfortable place to watch it because I'm an entertainment critic. And if I do not have a comfortable place to sit down and consume that media, I cannot continue to be a tax paying corporation in this country. So it was insane because we looked at it and she had done another fundraiser to make some other animated series. And she had hundreds of thousands of dollars on the books. We're like, you're trying to raise this amount of money. Be already have it by your own admission and literally the only thing her nonprofit does is release youtube videos <laughs> right <laughs> which you know like and she does speaking engagements but she's also paid for that right under the veil of some social cause that's really all you've got to do so in order to do the whole nonprofit, you've got to come up with how does this benefit you know the people we need to fucking just be like for the advancement of neckbeard peoples right <laughs> you know when you're examining media for the edification of the masses. <laughs> we're, we're examining media so that people may learn about that media. You know what I mean? That's it. We're educating people about the media that they consume, which is a very, f- by the way, fundamentally important thing to do in this time. Yes. When people are being bombarded with media, having some sort of focus and, uh, and, and and someone there to teach you how to critically uh, pull it apart and, and, and think about it critically and see the references it's making is very, very important. All right, so when we run this scan, we send Paul down to the office. Absolutely. <laughs> and die. It's fucking, I'll just put on my fucking Southern lawyer, lawyer character and it's over. Yeah, Paul, just show, yeah, just show up as uh, whatever the fuck you call that character. And, uh, what and- these boys are doing is edifying the nation. <laughs> I love it. All right, let's go on to uh, the big farm industry, TJ. Because remember that yeah, we have the image of the nice farmer working his fields. Yeah, I was looking at a fucking um, I don't even remember what I was looking at. It was some bottle of like ocean spray or some bullshit, and it was like yeah. farmer owned. I'm like, yeah, uh huh. <laughs> like I, I love the the difference between the imagery that's supposed to invoke in my head versus the reality. You know? Right, you're you're picturing a dude that's got a rusty old tractor and like yep. a piece of fucking hay in his mouth and a and a dirty old hat, and he gets up every morning before the fucking sun to till his field. You know, yeah, I think you, people because people's mentalities are still like we've never like people have never like evolved past that like oh like the 1920s farmer. Uh, you know, it's a regional thing too because where I grew up, farmer meant something very different. The farmers in the Central Valley where I grew up are all rich families. Right. Like I can still remember the names of the rich farming families in my, my community. And they all have giant, beautiful palatial Southern style houses on big tracts of land that they own and farm. And they all farm for some corporate conglomerate. Right. Of course. So it's like, you know, this is the, when you look at this graph here, 84% of the beef that you fucking eat in this country is concentrated in the top four, Beef producers. Yeah, most of our farm industry is called an ol- oligopoly. Right. Basically, uh, there's there's a number of players that control large portions of the market. So, Hog sixty six percent, poultry fifty nine percent, turkey fifty five, soybeans seventy, corn eighty percent, all seeds sixty percent. That company. corn, that's a fucking valuable ass crop because that's high fructose corn syrup. That's in everything. Oh. Oh, dude, completely. Like a lot of these things, it's like you say, like, oh, soybeans or corn, who cares? But it's not just the corn itself. It's all the products that are made with it. I mean, they make fuels with it. There's government subsidies for that. And we're, we're supposed to believe that we're supposed to believe there's some up. There's, there's like some great upward mobility in this fucking country. Like who the fuck at this point in our country's history could be like, you know what? I'm going to get into the corn business. You know what I mean? Like, no, you're not. You ain't getting in shit. You ain't getting into none of this. If you I mean, look, you could grow a little farm, sure. Yeah, you can get into the corn business, TJ. But the problem is, is that you're going to have to have a meeting with Monsanto and pick out a payment plan for your seeds. Mm-hmm. 
And you're going to have to have a meeting with the other corn producers and decide which one of them is going to middleman for you to the market because you're not going to take your corn directly to the market. If you do, have fun at the fucking stall on the street corner because that's about the best you're going to yep. sell. If you, if you want this shit to be on Get shelves... Get your corn! <laughs> right. If you want this shit to be on shelves, you're going to have to come through one of these corn producers and you just pick the one and whichever one takes the less scalp of your profit is the one you go with and by the end of the day you're making enough just to get by on your fucking horribly hard to work patch of fucking corn and uh that's your life as a farmer yeah if you want to get into the business now if you're already in the business if you're from one of these families that owns vast tracts of arable land and they've been doing this for three or four generations then it's different because then you've already you're already juiced in with one of these big corporations. You got a sweetheart deal. You get to keep your money. You get to be wealthy. You get to be powerful. There was really like in my community growing up when somebody was said, "Oh yeah, he's he's the his dad's a farmer." That was that was the same thing as saying that's a rich kid. So the image of a farmer is completely different in a lot of people's minds than the reality of a farmer. Yeah, like, most people that work in the farming industry own vast tracts of land and are part of huge conglomerates that make billions and billions of dollars. So see, they're rich. People. Yeah. When you, when you're fucking told about farmer, you're supposed to see like some dude in a fucking you know, Jode, you know, that's the image they sell you around in the dust, trying to get a turnip to grow or something. Right. And just that's the fucking guy. That's the guy they want you to see in your head. They want yeah, you to see like hard working American in the heartland, you know, hey, Two bushels of turnips strapped over the back of a fucking <laughs> throwback <laughs> to the farmer's market. You know what I mean? Yeah. Turnip. I'm the salt of the earth. And nope. That doesn't exist. Those people died off about fucking 40 years ago. The last one of them was bought out by Monsanto or fucking Soya or whatever the fucking company is that they were a part of. So, guys, you'll love this even more because this is one of the greatest scams because it's such an ascent. And we think about it, it makes sense why it's such an essential thing. You know, people need fucking food. We got to eat all the animals we have got to eat. You got to, the, the food supply has to fucking function or there really will be chaos. So during the early 20th century, a slew of federal agricultural policies were instituted to ensure small farmers from changing weather and to preserve a dependable food supply for the American people. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, right? You know, we got to protect our farms. And this is back when we had tons of farmers as a very common profession. Most people's profession was actually farmer at this time. So almost a century later, many of those policies are still in place except that beneficiaries are no longer small farmers, but big agribusiness, which right. received 75% of the subsidies. Over the past decade, the subsidies have cost the American taxpayer over $168 billion. Shocking. I am shocked. So think about this, guys. This, all is, these this guys, is my like, shock so Paul, You're talking about those guys, those fucking rich kids making all that. I mean, yeah. By yeah. all means, because they're fucking granddaddy, he wasn't paying shit for taxes. I always come back to it because it's such a fucking poignant part of my life. And I drove by it so many times and I had so much time to think about it. But that just that giant endless acres of citrus that would just be left season after season to fruit and rot on the ground. That dude was rich as fuck and he was being paid government subsidies to allow that food to rot on the ground to keep the prices of oranges high. Like that was, that's the, that's the scam. So he literally got paid to allow his fruit. And we're, we're not talking a tiny farm. We're talking about you drive for 20 minutes and you're still on this dude's land. You're still passing this dude's tract. You know what I mean? Of, of just fucking fruit laying on the fucking ground. And that dude is rich as fuck. And the government's paying his bills. The government's like, yep, keep the price of citrus nice and high. We need to, you to keep your, your tangerines on the farm this, this time around. Well, we'll no have dairy farmers too. Oh yeah. Milk. My mom was telling me in the midst of this fucking COVID shit that she was driving to a doctor's appointment. She had in the next town over and she drove by a dairy farm and witnessed them dumping big fucking tubs of milk in the field. Yep. In, in like the, in the compost. And it's like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> what is going on? Wait a minute. What? At a time where food is scarce at a lot of fucking places in this country, the dairy farmers of this country are not like shipping that shit to these communities. They're dumping it in their fucking fields. Well, the reality is, is that the supply is so fucking it exceeds the demand by far. It's even why a lot of fast food companies use a lot of cheese. Why do they use a lot of cheese? People love cheese. So they, fair enough point, point there. But it's because they have lobbying 
from these farmers and these big agribusiness saying like, look, these suppliers know that like these restaurants, these people need all they need to make money. They need to sell these food products. And they're like, look, an easy way to do that is cheese. It's cheap. Right. We'll give you a fucking, you know, huge, a steep discount for bulk purchases of our cheese. And you just, we keep, we'll keep you stocked in all the cheese that you need and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I mean, so it's just like, it's, it's like, like you said, it's just this giant fucking scam. This <laughs> idea of running a fucking restaurant and going to some local fucking non conglomerate cheese provider is just a joke. It's like, a, <laughs> You know what I mean? In this country, it's like there might be a couple of fucking local people that are making their own cheese and selling it to a local restaurant or something, but that's about the extent of it. It's that little kind of hand to hand, one on one transaction, farm to table. Like, yeah, there's like, and we've all been to probably most people have been to one. Like, there's like, they exist, but they're hipstery ish kind of places where it's like yeah. we grow our own arugula. It's like yeah. cool, but come on. Ah, uh, and you guys will love this. Corporate lobbying. Now here's here's a chart. Special interest politician. Bad. Nope. Can't interest. do that. Lobbyist politician. Good. Ah. Oh. Yep. Just add in another little thing. Uh, another another thing that's seared into my mind is that clip of a. Uh, a th- there's a clip of this fucking tobacco. I think it was a tobacco uh, lobbyist, literally cutting checks on the floor of the House of Representatives before a big vote about you know tobacco labeling and shit fucking unreal it's like the casino is not even hidden it's it's like right there on the floor of the house there's like each (laughs) each representative is sitting in front of a one-armed bandit and just plunking tax dollars into it (laughs) (laughs) fucking nightmare it's a total fucking nightmare supplied by these shady fucking corporations oh yeah we'll stake your bets it's all good, but just make sure you gamble on our machine. You know what I'm saying? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Here's some money. You know, oh, we can't really give you like directly a bunch of money, but here's what we'll do for you. You need a kitchen remodel. You want to take a long trip to Scotland with your family. We can do that. We can facilitate that. We can just make you a guest of our corporation and take care of your bills for you. It's, it's a fucking nightmare. And anybody that thinks that they're going to elect some fucking lily white politician that isn't corruptible by this is just ignorant of human nature at some point And at some level, everybody's purchasable and the people that aren't, aren't allowed to attain high positions of power. They're just not, if you're not corruptible, if you're not willing to do this dirt, you're not going to go very fucking far politically. You're going to get cut off and dried up. You're gonna wither on the fucking vine. It's like the uh, in the uh, not be there. It's like in the Dark Knight, or wait, one of the, one of the one of the Dark Knight movies, one of the fucking Nolan Batman's, where yeah. uh, all the cops are on the take except for you know Gordon doesn't want it, and he's the the other cop looks at him like you know when you don't have when you don't take a taste makes the rest of us cops nervous, and Gordon's like I'm no I'm hey I'm no rat. Even if I was, who's there even rat to in this city? And the other cops like, yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, it just reminds me of that. Uh, it's pretty much the same. Yeah, I mean, like, even if there was some great incorruptible politician that's like totally rejects this and is like, I will never even touch one of these a, a cent of this dirty money. Like, what the fuck is that motherfucker really going to do to challenge this system anyway? I'd like to think Bernie Sanders has a streak of that in him. Now, I don't think he would be completely opposed to getting his hands on some corporate money if it meant his, you know. Yeah, I have uh, no idea. I've never heard of a specific instance of that, but I mean, I don't, but, I don't know. You know. I'd like to think that, but that's why Bernie Sanders has had these two very popular amongst people campaigns that have just been scuttled by the powers that be because people like him are not allowed to rise to certain levels of power in this country. They're just not. If you're not on the take, it's that same fucking thing. It's that same sentiment that TJ was talking about from that Nolan film. Yeah. It's like if you're not on the take with us, if you're not part of this fucking money funnel, then you're a problem. You're 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 going to be a voice for the people in this. You're going to you're going to tell people what we're doing. You're going to no. Why would we let you attain power? No, we're defunding your fucking campaign. We're scuttling your campaign. We're sending fucking private investigators to dig some dirt out of your past. Oh, look, here's a topless picture of you kissing a woman. You're fucking done. You're done. Yeah, there's there's some we're going to dredge up. There's some there's there's some there's some impasse you're just going to hit. 
or in the case of Bernie Sanders, who really has nothing like that in his past to be dredged up. It's just like, well, we're just going to fucking scuttle you like, like yeah. what else to put it? Like, we're just going to absolutely support one candidate over you. Despite what people think, despite how they may vote, we're going to coordinate dropping out of multiple candidates and endorsements of another candidate. It's just, you know, whatever they got to do, there's no way. Bernie was ever going to get on the ticket. There was just, it wasn't going to happen. And this is why right here, because he isn't part of this chain. He's not willing to be the politician at the end of the green check Mark chain. Yeah, exactly. Taking fistfuls of money from. I'll tell Lombard you what, he doesn't need it either. Cause he, you know what? I, to that I, I, day, I, this I, motherfucker sends me texts like, yeah, send me more money. It's like, motherfucker, you are running for president no more. Get out of here. <laughs> well, no, here's the fucking Get thing. The people man. of Vermont to give you some money. Is, is that, and the crazy thing almost no one ever acknowledges with this problem is like, I know why the special interest exists and I know why the politician exists, but the lobbyist had to like basically create his own position. He had to basically go like, okay, we have to make it so you can't give the money directly. You have to give the money to me so that I can get rich off you giving the money to the politician. Right. Because they don't work. They, they work for lobbying firms. So it's a separate business that has intrinsic connections directly to the corporations that support it is funded by that corporation, but it's not the corporation directly. Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah exactly. It's not them. It's because, you know, oh, I have autonomy. I could, I can give the money wherever I want. And look, Scotty, this is great because it, this allows average citizens to set up organizations and, and uh, pool their resources together and send lobbyists to Washington. Wow. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need a middleman ourselves. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, uh, the Jack Abramoff scandal, everyone kind of remembers that. That was like, oh, lobbying. Oh, this is, this is the dark side of lobbying. This is, oh. Like, What's the bright side? <laughs> it was, it was, it, you know, I, I, well, exactly. But like, but people act like it was like, you know, especially the mainstream media. Oh, wow. This is crazy. But so then it's like, okay, we're going to crack down. We're going to crack down on this. So that's kind of the idea, you know, oh, no more after this. We, we learned our lesson. But of course, a series of loopholes have meant that any regulation or restriction on this have meant essentially nothing. Uh, it's it didn't really slow down the practice of flying congressmen to Brazil in return for favors. So now instead of paying for the trips directly, lobbyists and corporations set up a 501c3 to do the work for them. Right. So it's a nonprofit yet again. As recently as 2011. Oh, what's up? I was just saying it's the same fucking scam as the last one. They're literally using the nonprofit rules as a way to dodge to like to launder this money so it's not corporate money anymore now it's charitable money and then it's just given to politicians you guys will love this as recently as 2011 the international conservative caucus foundation spent a hundred thousand dollars sending four congressmen and their families on an african safari of course finding time along the way to tour a volkswagen factory which is an iccf donor ah uh, so, yeah, I mean, and, and like, look, this shit adds up to not a lot of the shit that um, we're talking about. Like, you, you, it's not like they're dumping fucking hundred thousand dollar trips in the lap of every senator and shit. Of course, they don't have to. Like, it's it's it, it reminds me of um, oh, fuck that fucking um, that movie uh, Casino. Oh, OK, yeah. Where they're talking about, um, fuck, man, the, the the thought fled my head as I was searching. You're talking about them paying the bosses or something, right, right, right. It's it's it's, you know, like just the just the point of that movie is is that the movement of sleazy money moves from middleman to middleman and ultimately ends up at the top. And so even if you're at the bottom, you have to play ball with these fucking people because they have the ability to starve your fucking campaign out. You know what I mean? So they don't even have to give you money. You still have to play ball because you know if their super PAC money doesn't come your way via the fucking corrupt ass DNC for the next election cycle, you're fucked. So you can't really take a stand even if they're not paying you. So if you're a powerful senator or a senator with a swing vote, you might get fucking lavish trips and shit. But for the average senator, it's just implicit bullying. It's like, look, if you don't go the way that we want you to go, next time it comes time for you to get reelected, there's just not going to be a lot of money to go around. You know, we got a lot of candidates this year. You feel me? Well, the reality too is like, it, it's, it's like a culture, 
you know, it's like there's a YouTube culture, and there's like these all little, these little subsets and, and like sub little niche cultures that exist, and the political one is no different. And oh, I remember probably- what I was gonna say about the it's 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 when he's talking about how like these senators and shit in Vegas they bought their comp life when they got elected. Yeah. And that's the that's basically it. It's like, yeah, you might not be getting like fucking eight thousand dollar safaris or whatever from these people all the time, but you walk into a place, you eat for free, you get to go to all these galas where they give away all this fucking corporate swag and shit. You get invited to all these fundraisers where they give you just all you know, all this shit adds up. Like you live a life of privilege where people defer to you. Once you've gained this position and all of that money traces right back to corporations, it's all dirty money. It's all meant to influence your vote. It's all meant to make that person sit there in front of that vote that they know would fuck that tobacco company that financed that trip to Vegas for them. You know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> yeah. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Fucking ways that I just described that they're coming at people with this. It's fucking unreal that it's even thought about allowed to be uh, uh, legal in this country, Uh, let alone completely the way that business is done. Yeah, it's beyond legal. It's just like it's the status. It's like the entrenched status quo that's unquestionable. And I mean, people people have been criticizing the system for years. Like we ain't fucking telling anybody something they don't know here. (laughs) Everybody knows if, this if shit. We are. They ain't been listening to us. Well, it, it's, just to give, it's just nice to give specific examples and just oh, let sure. people know. Like this is just like scratching the surface of this. I don't know. You go around though, and you ask people about like lobbyists or something. It's like you you're gonna find one person. It's like yeah, lobbyists are great. I, I gotta take a piss. I'll be right back. Okay. You're not gonna find too many people that are fucking gonna sit there and extol the virtues of fucking lobbyists to you. You know what I mean? They don't. Have, yeah, of course not. But you know, so everybody knows this is fucked up. Everyone knows that this system is fucking run on money. And no, they don't give a shit about what the fucking will of the people is. That's why the fucking approval rating of fucking, um, you know, Congress is so low. Right. But what, what, what choice do we have? We're given their choice. So when it, when it comes to time for the fucking to go to the ballot box and change this, if you wanted to, you're given their choice of, of politician. Yeah, you want the ones that are in the pocket of these lobbyists or the ones that are in the pocket of these lobbyists? Your if you're in, in, in an area that's politically revel, relevant, that goes all the way down to your local politicians. Oh, yeah. You can't even go and elect your city council and your mayor without them t- getting a little taste of this shit. If you live in an area that's politically re- relevant, if you live in some podunk area, fucking who cares? Oh, yeah, they'll let, just let that go. Do, if they do anything in your town that shakes the apple tree too hard, it'll be rescinded real quick. Let's just put it that way. Right. Or they'll send or they'll make sure. Oh, is this actually uh, this area actually did something politically relevant? All right. Well, now we'll fucking get the lobbyists down there. Uh, yeah, actually, this is illegal. And you broke several statutes and your mayor has now been uh, led away in fucking irons. And you've got a new mayor now, though. Mayor Don't worry. Bigby, he's here to fucking fix it all, man. Take take us back to normalcy. Mm-hmm. And man, good old Mayor Bigsby, of course, he's at the end of this chain. He's that politician gladly taking that fucking sack of money or whatever it is. Swag invitations all around the world to fucking big royal political galas. And, you know, the list goes on and on, man. They get to live a fucking life of luxury that you can only fucking imagine. But not for you. And, all, and it's all on the corporate dime. And then ultimately on our dime because those corporations are paying an effective zero tax rate because their money is well invested in these politicians. So really, it's just you and I financing a lavish lifestyle for people who we pretend are politicians there to take care of us. Fuck this system. Anybody that fucking defends the continuation of this shit is a fucking empty headed moron, in my opinion. Like, how, how do you look at something so fucking bare faced and come away going, well, maybe we can change it from the inside. Get the fuck <laughs> what out even, of my face. What even bro- bro- blows my mind more is you got people that are like, like halfway. Like they look at the full system and they're like, well, I'm only against this half of the system. You know what I mean? Like conservatives be like, yeah, them politicians are fucking fucking bunch of scumbags but man i love the entrepreneur i and love see, the businessman you know 
you know what the funny thing is? We've been sitting here ranting about this one type of thing, this lobbyist idea, right? Right. We're not even we're not even talking about the 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 this is just the legal way that they bribe politicians. It's just the way they do it in the sunlight. Oh yeah. This is counting the under the table shit, the fixing of fucking oh, your son got in a fucking uh DUI or something. Let us you know what? We're sending one of our lawyers right now. Let us take care of that. That type of shit, this under the table fucking bullshit benefit that happens all of that shit is still going on you know it is oh yeah of course. they're not just strictly adhering to this fucking loophole that they've created they're still breaking the law they're still fucking going under the table with these congressmen they're still giving favors that they know this is you favors. know this is all this is the plausible deniability right it wasn't us that it lobbyist was, oh he was so evil it was this organization that really cares about the tobacco industry they're the ones that donated to the campaign fund, not us. God, we just love tobacco industry. I don't gave, know. We gave our customary two thousand dollars. You know, of course. I mean, we're allowed that, but we didn't break any. We didn't cross any lines. Well, see, the middle. That's why the middleman is just so essential because not only is he taking the money from them, but it's all it's they're buying deniability on both ends because the politi- the company can go. We just told him to talk to him and say, "Look, we really want you to pass this legislation because we care about it." And the politician goes, well, he he misrepresented himself. I didn't know. So the lobbyist, is, of course, ultimately can take all the fucking blame if necessary. Yeah, it's just it's just a brilliant fucking way of avoiding any real responsibility or regulations or rules. <sighs> I mean, they and, just- and ultimately can rewrite the rules too. Because let's say let's say there's something illegal that they really want to do legally, they just change the law. Boom, now it's legal. Yeah, it reminds me again of of that fucking movie Casino. When Sam is describing the organization at the beginning of the movie, he says that Las Vegas was like a morality car wash for the mafia. <laughs> he was like, it was like we were allowed to come here and do all the things that w- get us persecuted all over the country, but it's like fucking straight out legal here. So that's what the middleman affords the politician. The politician gets to, you know, break at least go directly against the spirit of the law. But they get to feel good about it because they didn't they didn't take this money directly from fucking, you know, a, a tobacco lobby or an oil lobby or something. They took it from this concerned citizens group, you know, of course. <coughs> you got to love the beauty of these scams, at least in that uh, respect. So now we're going to move on, guys, to tax loopholes. So let's say you had you legitimately had to make some money and you're rich. Oh, it does happen, believe it or not. But I mean, who the fuck likes paying taxes? I mean, I know we need social services. You know, you need the fucking fire department. Some people say you don't need the police, but people like you need police. Of course, you, know, you need infrastructure. You need things to make a society function. So we have to pay some form of tax or contribute in some way. But it doesn't mean people can't kind of creatively, you know, look at the rules and say, hey, I can make this you know, a better tax situation for myself. I mean, I think everyone tries to do that. Sure. I mean, right, guys. So how about uh, this yacht deductions? You guys are cool with that, huh? Yacht deductions. Yeah, I mean, you got to have a yacht, and you shouldn't have to pay tax on I mean, it. Look, I mean, I want to show you guys a, a boat here real quick. I mean, look at this boat. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful boat. It's a big-ass boat. It'd be real fun to, like, tool around in some calm Ooh. seat on that boat. Oh, it looks comfy in there. I mean, I mean guys, look at this. Wow. Yeah. It's like, just like a kitchen. It's like a whole big old house on the on the, on the the sea. Pretty pretty awesome. A nice living room. I was just... I was, Oh, we got oh, we got a bedroom. Oh yeah, wow. that's cool. comfy. That's cozy, man. Guys, I mean, it's, this could almost be like you could like live on a yacht, dude. Right? Yeah, you totally could. You could, you know. So uh, here's some way that rich assholes fuck the country a little bit harder. So a yacht deduction certainly seems like one of those tax loopholes for the rich, but it's actually a creative use of the mortgage interest deduction anyone can take, but it is for rich people. Uh, so in 2018, you, and I mean, I, I, technically anyone, but of course, rich Fox mainly can deduct the interest you pay up to $750,000 on mortgage debt. So the average person does take this actually, but the savings obviously go up the more money you have in order to be eligible. A quote home has to have sleeping, cooking and toilet facilities. This yacht would definitely qualify, uh, which can be a mobile home, a trailer or a boat. And if your primary home is paid off, which is mainly rich assholes, 
you can deduct the mortgage interest on your yacht instead. Got it. It's great. So your yacht, you live on your yacht. Oh, well, your primary home is paid off. Well, you can still deduct the yacht now. So, so you just get to buy a giant opulent boat and then subsidize it with tax breaks. Yes. I you know, love it. A, a, a huge deduction too, but I, I don't think I even got into that one, but uh, there's another way to actually do it. With you know what yacht. I was thinking so, guys, I was, uh, I was sitting here and I was like, man, I mean, these rich people and stuff, uh, I know these guys got like a big mansion and shit. I was like, you know what we should do as taxpayers in this country? I think we should fucking get together and get this fucking guy a yacht. You know what I mean? Yeah, he deserves it. I mean, like, come on. He works hard. I mean, he's up there. He's, all he's got is this giant cavernous mansion, and he's like one of the fucking few millionaires without a yacht. How lonesome do you think fucking Bill Gates is? Because he doesn't have a boat. He needs a yacht. I mean, he's living right. He lives on the water. He needs a big fucking yacht. He's given us so much. It's time for all of us taxpayers in this country to fucking subsidize Bill Gates's yacht. You think it was so kind of crazy because people like people always wonder like why do rich people all have yachts? Like so if you got a certain level of wealth, it's like Bezos, you know, fucking Paul Allen when he was alive. You might as well. Bill it's free. Gates, all these big guys like they all have yachts, right? Yeah, of course. Why not? Uh, here's another thing you can actually do. Uh, you can charter your yacht. Mm, As yeah. many yacht uh, owners actually know, and this is obviously the, the rich, the ruling class, it takes just a little prudence to make your yacht work for you. Ah. So, guys, I mean, you buy this yacht, right? But, I mean, why not make it a business? Well, yeah, you're not going to use it year-round. So, it's yeah. like it's not being used. It's a business, and you can rent it out to people, and then you can claim another deduction because now it's not a luxury item. It's a business yeah, so the first thing you do is you place your yacht in charter. Mm -hmm. uh, this doesn't mean you have to put your yacht in some foreign charter or some faraway place. You can do it in a local, so it's convenient for you. Uh, and by chartering your yacht, you're essentially, you are allowing a charter company to charter or rent your vessel to other sailors by the day or week. Yep. It's similar to owning a vacation home that you run out most of the year. It's like an Airbnb. Yeah, so, so not only not only do you write it off on your taxes as a secondary residence... But uh, you also get to, you know, make money off it. So that's cool. You just plan ahead. Well, if, well you, you, look, you can't take those both at the same time. Oh, you, you can't can do, do both of them? <laughs> okay, sure. So well, you could do the first one this. until it's paid off and then do the second one, right? Well, it, you could take either or. Uh, so then you so say, let's well, say. Well, no, what I'm asking is, couldn't, couldn't you just like, you get the yacht. You get the tax dollars. You get, you pay for it with your tax breaks for the tax dollars. And then once you're, you got it paid off, you just turn it into a business. And get yourself a new yacht. Be like, I'll just charter that yacht while I pay for you my could. new yacht. You definitely yeah, you could do that. End up making a tidy sum of money just chartering a bunch of yachts. I bet rich people do it. Yeah. I bet a lot of the yachts that are rented by these companies are owned by rich fucks. A, a lot of them maybe by the same rich fuck. I'm tired of this yacht. Uh, this yacht's like two years behind the times. I'm going to get me a yeah. new yacht, charter this yacht to less rich people. Yep. Uh, so when you decide to use your yacht as a business, TJ, you're eligible for. I want everyone. Tax. I want everyone watching this video. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Scotty, but I want everyone watching this video. If and when there comes a day when the people rise up and start guillotining these motherfuckers in the street, I just want this episode to exist as a historical document. Whenever anyone asks, like, why did that happen? Oh, it will. <laughs> I mean, we've been whistling the same fucking tune for like. I mean, I have I've been doing it for at least ten years on the fucking internet. That's traceable. You've been doing it longer. <laughs> like we've been whistling this goddamn tune. You whistled a different tune for a little while, but you've been basically <laughs> consistently whistling the same tune for fucking twelve years on YouTube. It's like, yeah, no, this is a testament. Like this shit. When we talk about this shit, it will be remembered as why this fucking <laughs> political uprising happened. Not that I endorse that. <laughs> Of you course, like this. So basically, there's several tax savings you're going to get, uh, mm -hmm. which are basically the same benefits that business owners get when they buy equipment for their business. So when your yacht is placed in a charter, it becomes a business asset, and it's no longer considered a personal asset. Very convenient. Uh, mm -hmm. Many yacht owners are actually able to reduce the cost of buying and owning a yacht by more than half. Thank you, taxpayers. Awesome. Thank you. So next time you see a rich person with a yacht, just remember... Half of that's paid for by that. you. Well, not you. I'm paying for that. 
Are you enjoying it? Is it good? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> See you later. I think we should all just go and fucking. Uh, we'd be like, this ad is a <laughs> this yacht is a public asset. We're just we're getting on it. <laughs> Everyone just climb on the yacht. I wonder in the yacht? then the police will show up and you just explain to them like, look, half of this was paid for with tax dollars. So we feel that we the people and then, you know, and then you're shot. But at least you ruin their yacht by getting it all bloody. You know, that's true. <laughs> at least their yeah, yacht. They buy a new yacht. Yeah. <laughs> at least you got their yacht all messed up. Of course, their insurance will pay for it. Probably just buy you know, a new yacht. get like a deep fat fried yacht and use this scam. Uh, I don't Do see it. The problem with all these scams is like it, then we just charter it. And so the charter is paying the mortgage. Yeah. Like well, the money that we're getting from the charter service is paying the mortgage. And then we can just like mark a calendar a couple months ahead of time and be like, hey, this is my two weeks on the fucking deep fat fried yacht. And we could just go sail out into the Gulf and yeah, fish for like swordfish Scotty. or something. Scotty, make the logistics of this work. Get us yeah, a yacht. Get a I'm, deep- getting right, I'm getting right on it, guys. I, I've actually, that's why I've been. Quiet. How come you know about all these damn, damn Scotty? I'm filing right now. Here's what I want to know, Scotty. How come you know about all these damn loopholes, but you ain't fucking putting that shit to work for us? Where's yeah, our yacht? Good. Where's our nonprofit? Where's our Cayman Islands fucking bank account? Come on, you, Scotty. You're you have slacking. No reason to know that that's not what's going on. Yeah. Hey, can you imagine the fucking amazing parties we could have as a group on that fuck on a yacht like that, dude? Look. You guys, as far as the finance of the business, are on a need to know basis. Gotcha. But you know what? We don't, I don't need to know. All right. I need a yacht. Well, I think we need, I think, I think here's the thing because t- you guys have both unlocked this. You're both, I guess you both have the background to unlock this because Scotty has unlocked the fact that we need to get a yacht. TJ has unlocked the fact that why stop at one? Like, you know, let's get the mortgage, let's get a big ass yacht. And then let's get two more, and then we each have one. Paul, what is a yacht without bitches? Yeah, we need bitches. Tax deductible titties. Tax deductible titties. Okay, I support that. All right, okay, guys. Let's, uh, huh? Kill your cams, please. Oh, okay. I'll kill it. Paul's is already dead. Mine is killed. Mine's dead too. Let's see what we got. What's this? Mine, my, mine is dead technically as well. Yeah, I get it. Love. Chesty love. You guys hear it? Yeah. Jesus jumped up, Jehoshaphat Christ. Mama mia, papa pia, baby got the diarrhea. Hello, nurse. Jiggly wiggly wiggly wiggly. Bounce bounce bounce. Boing boing boing. Hong hong hong. Sorry. I think Paul's gonna lose his mind at this segment. Oh yeah, hacha hacha. The fuck is that, man? Big old titties, though. <laughs> scary. He doesn't know if he wants to fucking whip it out and jerk off now or later. He's like, hmm. Uh. Why are people laughing, man? All these bitches are jealous. Oh, yeah, dude. They're totally jealous right now. Jealous of the mega titties. She got she got up there on the stool by herself. Did the audience uh, lost uh, it? Uh, Them titties caused a minute distraction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, she looks down at them like, yeah, there's some big tits. Man, that's some giant fucking titties, dude. Yes. I was huge to begin with. Yeah, well, I, I went even larger. Something, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you ha- you made them even larger. And why? Why? Well, my salary is in direct proportion to the size of the, of the chest. That's really what the clubs and the, and the customers want. Yeah. Uh, I mean, duh. So this is basically, as I understand it, you, you even have these are tax deductions. Yes. These are depreciating no, assets. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wait, for, for, look, we're, we're running a serious show here, and we want to give some financial <laughs> advice. No, you aren't. So for no, those who no, are tax lawyers. But tax yes. deductible titties. She's a stripper, and part of her business is her big fat titties. And the bigger and fatter they are, the more money she can make. Ergo, they're a business write-off. So, so this is what happened. See, the IRS indicated, so they actually have guidance on this, the breast implants 
are considered cosmetic surgery and as such do not qualify as a medical expense. So that, that's their, that's basically their line on it. Okay. But Chesty Love, a stripper, you know, we just saw an exotic dancer argued the size of her uh, 56N breast implants were required for her employment and unsuitable for everyday use, which qualified them for a tax deduction. And guess what, guys? A tax court agreed. Damn. Good. I just want to say that tax court is the most based court in all the land. Yeah, dude. The t- They should rename that court the titty court. <laughs> <laughs> dude, we want... Fuck, why are we doing this show? We should have a show called Titty Court. Dude, tear down this court and rebuild build two giant titty domes Dude. for it to exist in and call it fucking Titty Central from Wait now a minute. On. Let's combine both of our ideas, Paul. Yeah. Let's fucking when we get our yacht, we'll fucking decorate it like a courthouse and we'll fucking film a show on the yacht called Titty Court and then it's all tax deductible because it's all business. I like this idea, dude. And you this could be good. like you could be like the honorable judge like Whatever. <laughs> I don't know what you call yourself. Wilkington Bursberry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'll be your plaintiff or whatever. And Scotty can be like, I don't know what Scotty can be. Some kind of fucking magistrate or some bullshit. Doesn't matter. We'll come up with a concept. The point the is, dude. yeah, Scotty can, can prosecute the case. And we just get like all the all all kinds of chicks with big fat titties. And when then we drive them off the coast and then we have them pull their titties out and we film it. Yeah, and make a show of it, and then we somehow we come up with some kind of fucking issue, like tit related issue that must be decided, but it's just a pretense anyway. So who cares? Well, then this is a jumping off too because our fucking business at that point would be so titty centric. We could start titty pack. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. right? By a politician. And then we're in the fucking game, boys. And then we should we could get it all fucking. We could say the whole thing is a nonprofit because we're educating America on titty related issues. Yeah, just breast. We'll just breast cancer or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. got to get a mammogram and free mammograms for women. That's what we're about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Titty pack. Titty pack. Whoop whoop. And we'll buy some politicians, and they'll fucking you know. Yeah, this is great. Oh, yeah. I would love to fly to Scotland for a titty convention on your dime, sir. That sounds like a very relevant thing to the country. Yeah, I look forward to meeting my first lobbyist to come to bribe me, dude. That's like that's what I'm looking forward to the most. God, yeah, the day that the fucking lot. Well, I mean, like, would I'm we? I'm gonna cry. I'm literally gonna cry when he hands me the check. Um, <laughs> it's gonna be so beautiful. And- <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I've never so felt much. more American than I do right now. I've never. I've truly made it. I'm today. I can credibly call myself a fucking American for the first time. I just took my first bribe from a corporation. <laughs> oh God! Let's <laughs> go out and celebrate on taxpayer money. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. What kind of titty bar do you like? This episode has been eye opening. Uh, it's been brown eye opening for me. Oh, yeah. We've been getting horse fucked in this country for a, 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 a number of generations. Yeah, but now uh, that we know, we can, we can do, do the what? horse fucking. So, what, you know, who, hey guys, I mean, I know Pawnee don't like to gamble, but TJ, you like to gamble. I love gambling. Gambling man, right? I love me some gambling. You know, sometimes you're the bug, TJ. Sometimes you're the windshield, man. Yep. It's hard, man. Gambling ups ups and downs, TJ. You can downs be downs and ups. Sky high, down in the dumps the next moment. So uh-huh. if you win money on a gambling trip, TJ, you can deduct any losses from the same trip before you calculate the taxes on your winnings. Well, fuck, I wish I'd have known that. You can deduct losses up to the amount of your winnings. And you will have to, ha- but you will have to itemize. Gotcha. So you make sure you keep good records of how much you want to. Well, next time so I, next time players. I go to, next time I take a trip to Vegas, which probably won't be for a while because it's COVID shit. But next time I do that, I will make note of that. So, so oh, go ahead, Paul. I was just going to say, I have an uncle that basically used this to like work a normal job and gamble all the time. Because he would, he would, he would uh, keep, you know, he would itemize his winnings and deduct his losses and shit from his taxes. So, yeah. Your uncle is dope. But I mean, he still lost lots of fucking money at the casino. Your uncle is still dope. But, you know, he managed yeah. to find a way to do it sustainably, I guess. But Paul, it's not just that. So you can obviously do that too. On your 2018 return, you can also deduct reasonable expenses that you incur- incurred in order to get to that big win at the craps table. 
Reasonable expenses can include things like travel to the casinos or the racetrack. Yeah. What about drinking? Because, you know, sometimes you make a case. I dr- I'm a better gambler when I'm drunk. Accommodations, maybe. Mm. Yeah. I mean, look, if you're out of town, I mean, if you have to travel to Las Vegas or you need somewhere to stay while you're doing your job as a gambler. Yeah, this is a side. This is not. This is a side profession for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's yeah. You you, you said to say it's no longer a hobby. I'm doing this and I'm making money. Yes, I am. I am a professional gambler as my my side career. Wow. I mean, if you went and gambled literally under those auspices, then yes, you could deduct all those things. I'm blown away by your fucking. (laughs) I'm I'm blown away by how. (laughs) I'm blown away by how fucking amazing slash horrible our country is. It really is. It's it's a fucking it's rich kind of, scam artist paradise, dude. Part of me looks at it and says like, "Wow, this is fucked up." But another part of me looks at it like, "All right, you know, you got to respect them balls." I mean, you got to you got to stand in awe at the brilliance of a system that has existed for as long as ours has and just really horse fucked 90% of the population but made them like grateful for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, if the whole system shoves a fucking big horse dick up your ass and fucks you until you can't even fucking breathe or know which way is up and then at the end you're ready to fucking thank him for it about this like yeah thank you system so just like i needed that about about this too what's up i'm sorry to interrupt you no that's cool but uh and i like you hear my story about some guys like yeah my rich uncle or you know i know this rich guy i was friends with this guy who had a rich you know cousin or whatever so i went to las vegas so when these guys Go on these fucking like crazy hangover esque trips. We're getting the deluxe suite. We're getting all this shit. The rich guy's gonna go up there and he's gonna gamble away millions of dollars, or maybe win millions. But let's say he, you know, he loses that night. He wins. He loses. He wins. Yeah. That guy at the end of the fucking year can use that to save even more money off his fucking taxes, and and leave you yet again with the fucking bill. So even something like gambling, where it's like he's gonna lose the money, it's like he's not even losing. If you're rich, it's not even losing. It's gaining. Right. You're really gaining something by losing at, at the same time. You're deferring a tax <laughs> that you would have normally had to pay. And so there's actually an incentive to do it. You're spending you're sp- <laughs> you're spending what you should have been spending in taxes on gambling and then claiming an exemption. And being and it's absolutely legal to do so. You know, I just it's, it's times like this where I just say to myself, you know, if tomorrow all the things were gone that I'd worked for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I yeah. thank my lucky stars to be living here today because the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away. Right. That is true. Because I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. This country is a fucking joke, man. I love this fucking place, and I hate it so much. Yeah. Uh, final, uh, I have such deeply cool ambivalent TJ. feelings about my fucking country, man. Oh, it's horrible. It's wonderful. Oh, what do I think? Oh, ah. you know what? You can tell your parents about this one. Tell your mom about this one, because look. Uh, ah. Personal pool deduction. Yeah. Could have saved your parents some tax money. You told them that. Should like, hey, like, this is unfair. You guys could save some, have some serious tax savings. I know about this shit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Back when I lived in California, when I was married, I had a pool. I, I didn't know I was taking a personal pool deduction. No, let's see. No, here, but here's the difference. Because you, you probably didn't build the pool, did you? No, I bought the house and the pool. Okay, the pool yeah. So if you install a pool for medical reasons, you could take a big tax break. A taxpayer who suffered from emphysema and bronchitis was prescribed swimming as a regimen by his doctor as part of his treatment. He built a pool and was able to write off the cost, less the amount his home value increased due to the pool. Damn. He can also write off the cost of pool upkeep. Damn. What if you so just... I could have, like, torn out my pool and had a new one put in and been like, look, my doctor said I'm obese. Yeah, I and need I to need swim to... My joints are fucking fucked up, so I need, you know, aqua size. I need to have a pool. Yeah. You write this fucking... Olympic sized fucking heated swimming pool off. I've been diagnosed with with uh, stress and uh, the pool relieves my stress. So. Yeah, the, the, my doctor has told me that swimming is one of the most beneficial things that I can do. And well, I need to have a pool. It's a medical expense. It's, it's a write off, man. 
Why don't we have a fucking deep fat fried pool? We are fucking stupid. Yeah, across the board, what I'm learning from this episode is that we're fucking idiots that should be fucking scamming the system way more than we are. Dude, we could have a yacht. We could have a fucking mansion that we could all use whenever we want and then sublet it out as a fucking rental for most of the year. We could have we could have a pool at a property that we could all use whenever we want with barbecue equipment and beautiful fucking speakers and comfy couches to sit on and, you know, a fucking lemonade, an ice lemonade machine back there that you put the ice in and it makes the nice slushies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Scotty, what the fuck are you doing? It It could say on the bottom of the pool deep like our logo could be at the bottom of that fucking pool amen and and the pool lights could be our colors they could be like orange and red and shit so it lights up our colors at night man we are so fucking dumb we're fucking pool exemption this is ridiculous we're We're all like me and tj are both fat fucks we both need to exercise we need a deep fat fried pool for free give us our pool scotty well, you still have to pay for the pool. What do we want? Our pool. When do we want it? Now. The pool. So at the end of the year, we paid nothing in taxes because we bought the pool. Yeah. And we get to benefit from having a pool, which we wouldn't have had if we had just paid our taxes. Amen. What the fuck is wrong with us? We're fucking stupid. <laughs> I don't know, man. We should just We're have a fucking pool. I don't stupid. fucking tell you. I can see. I had a fucking pool now. I mean, Paul, you needed a pool when you were a kid. I mean, that's how you got a bad back now. I- I can see the beautiful crystal clear blue water shimmering around our logo, which is beautifully fucking laid in and Italian fucking tile at the bottom of this pool, dude. A fucking men. I can see it like it's like like it exists, man. Like it's already there. Dude, I can feel but at the bottom of the pool. You know what else I can feel, dude? The beautiful, clean, open ocean breeze in my face as I ride at the fucking helm of the deep fat fried yacht. Cause it's my week to take her out and fucking just do whatever I want. Sailor wherever I fucking want to sailor. Hell yeah. I can feel the ocean spray in my face right now, TJ. And our pole, our fucking yacht sake. has a pool on it too. We need to forsake all this stupid political bullshit. We've been talking, walk away from it and sell out already. What the fuck are we doing, man? You know know what'll happen to us? You bought in, man. You know what'll happen, Paul? You know what'll fucking happen? What? We talk all this shit about these fucking stupid, complacent Americans are never going to fucking rise up against their rich masters. And then we'll fucking sell out as hard Uh as we can, get super rich, get all this shit. And then the fucking revolt will happen and our heads will end up on fucking pikes, dude. Well, I mean, just our fucking luck, man. man. I'm telling you, at least it'll be a luxury pike. Yeah. There are worse ways to go than being dragged to a, di- a guillotine in the midst of a blow job in your own personal hot tub in a giant mansion on an island. Somewhere. It was good while it lasted. <laughs> you know what I mean? There are worse ways to go out. Yeah. Fair enough. God damn it, man. Well, loopholes might have depressed you, but hopefully your spirits will be raised with plot holes. I plot do holes. Plot. Yeah. This is fun yeah, because then you guys are actually aware of any of these puddles. That you get to feel doing. superior to like fucking everyone. Who, like you, you know, when you like watch the credits, at the end of a movie, mm-hmm. you know, and you fucking see all those names, you get to feel superior to each and every one of those names. When you catch a plot hole in a movie, like pff, none of them caught it, but I did. Yep. Fucking idiots. Fucking bunch of dumb shits. Yeah. They don't know shit, do they? Best boy, <laughs> worst boy, uh, more oh, like yeah. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some shit like that. So this is a Terminator Two plot hole. The T one thousand shouldn't be able to time travel. You yeah, that's true. One? No, yeah, I mean that's true because it's only only living flesh can go. And I I always thought it was stupid that the Terminator could even do it. But at least they had the excuse of like he's wrapped in living flesh. That's the thing. That's why I I think I don't think it's a plot hole because like he says it's living flesh over metal endoskeleton. Right. But this thing's not living flesh on this is the isn't he, he's not living flesh at all. He's just fucking taking the form. He's li- literally liquid metal that's oh, just mimicking liquid. the form. Right. Yeah, how did he get back in time? That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, because we're not talking about Arnold. We're t- okay. Now you know I'm I, on the right page. Now, yeah, you're right. You know what else yeah. I wondered about that all the time? Is even as a kid, I'm like, why don't they just like 
if they have the ability to fucking like if if anything that's wrapped in flesh can go, why don't they just get like some crazy future gun, wrap Maybe. it in some fucking fake skin and send that back with them? You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, they, they, there, there are some fucking plot holes to that. I'd like to say that, like, maybe because this thing is such a quantum leap in technology, that maybe part of that quantum leap was, you know, fucking they, uh, fucking Skynet finally found out a way around the flesh barrier or whatever. What is it called when fans of something make like Mary Sue? No, no, no. no. When, when a, when a fan like is in, is confronted with a plot hole and they're like, make up their own shit to like uh, have its own name. I feel like it does. Uh, like, like you're kind of like going the realm of like, fan, like almost like it's, a, it's kind of like a fan theory, but like, um, like an alternate explanation. Like, yeah, it's oh like they like fucking, um, I mean, ultimately they're, they're, they're making, they're making apologetics. Like they're doing apologetics for a, a plot hole that, that a movie is left. I mean, I just did it for this one, right? It's, it, it's in no way insinuated by the plot that Skynet has gained the ability to break the flesh barrier, nor does the T 1000 show up in a ball of flesh. He's yeah. just back. So it is a plot hole. Like ultimately yeah. it's a plot no, hole. This is what happens. So I'll explain it for the people at home. Okay. So. Hello. In the, oh yeah. I'll, I'll, it, it was a lag or something. So in the Terminator, we learn from this guy, Kyle Reese. Yes. Himself that time travel is only possible for living organisms, or in the case of the T-800, a machine surrounded by living tissue. This is why both Kyle and the T-800 are shown arriving in 1984 naked, because things like clothing can't make the trip. Right. Yet if that's the case, how can the T-1000, which is entirely liquid metal, manage to travel through time in Terminator 2? We'd have to come up with a MacGuffin that isn't explained in the movie like i did like oh yeah skynet because yeah the t-1000 is liquid metal so it's way more technologically advanced and with that technological advance came the ability for skynet to break the flesh barrier and send machines back and but there's another dumb thing about that actually me inventing a bunch of bullshit that the plot clearly does not address you know what i mean oh no definitely not like so Another dumb thing about sending the T-1000 back is he still time travels naked. So it's like he's still naked, but it shouldn't even matter because he's not organic. So maybe his metal can mimic flesh well enough that he can do it. Like he can turn into pretty much anything and he can look like flesh. So maybe the outside of that liquid metal is so good at mimicking flesh that it makes it possible. And that's why he has to come back naked. So apparently uh, James Cameron has an explanation for the plot a plot hole. He says like it actually claims he was aware of the plot hole. Okay. Well this planned, is Yeah, and he planned to fill it by revealing the T one thousand travels through time encased in a covering of flesh, which would then uh, slice its way out upon arrival. However, this was deemed potentially confusing and never made it past the script stage. As it stands, the only way of explaining things is, is by charitably assuming the T one thousand's ability to mimic people extends to basically just tricking time machines or pulling in. So basically the, the thing actually, Paul just said, way cool, dude. If, if you dude the Cameron vision for that dude, it bouncing like around, like it's just liquid in a big flesh ball. And then it just like morphs blades and cuts itself out of its own womb. And is yeah, like, but they wouldn't be able to do the, so cool. they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to do the whole fake out in that movie then though, which is well, cause if you, if you watch T2 without knowing what's going to happen in it, yeah, we you liquid. Yeah, you don't you you kind of you kind of still assume that you you assume it initially that that's the protector and that yeah you know now right. I think yeah, most people right. most that people know true. by now that that's not the case. So I, mean, I don't know how many people really be spoiling it for at this point. The fake out kind of is ruined by just like how well known well, yeah, the movie but I mean, is. But that first time that you saw it, you were faked out by it. Like the first time I saw T2, it got me, you know what I mean? And it's, a, it's definitely a cool device that wouldn't have been possible. You're right. If they, if they revealed, maybe they could show it like in, in like a flashback or something. Like, how did it get here? How did it break the flesh barrier? And he could be like, they, they, they arrive in the, in what, in a womb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then they could show it as, as Arnold describes it. Well, and here's they, the thing is like, is it really that distracting of a plot hole? You know what I mean? Like, 
Yeah, but it would have been cool to see, like just seeing That's the true. flesh ball like land and bounce and roll, and then have the blades shank out of the side. And I, mean, just- I don't think it ruins the movie. I mean, of course, just like dude, I mean, some plot holes are, are worse than others. Like, I mean, obviously, yeah, this is a, a plot hole, but whatever. I mean, it doesn't really ruin Terminator Two. It's not going to watch and go that plot hole is just too much to get over. I'm turning the TV off. You know. I mean, I didn't even really like I said before you explained it to me. I didn't even realize it existed. So I'd, I've been a fan of these movies and I've watched a bunch of times and I've just never really thought about it that way. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same so, boat. I mean, I, I, I I've had. I feel, the, go ahead. I feel the movie did a great job just going with it and making the movie about the action and not about the minutia. And I'm willing to forgive shit like that. I don't think it's like a major glaring plot hole. Yeah. Because the end result is a badass, fucking well conceived, well thought out movie. See, and if they've got to bend the fucking weird, I mean, we're already talking about a movie about time traveling fucking machines that look like humans. Look on. I feel like there was a, uh, I've been trying to figure out what that term was for like when fans have to kind of like do the heavy lifting to make excuses for whatever their medium is. Water. I have not been able to find that term. I swear there was a fucking term. If anyone in the fucking comments knows it, let me know. I just want to throw like, that is out it there. a scientific name. No, it's just like, it was a term that was being tossed around because there was like a lot of, there's obviously a lot of instances where fans feel compelled to defend a series and of course, excuse away. It's plot holes. They'd say you were simping for it now. Yeah, That's they probably say something cool. like that now. But there was like a fucking there was like a term people were using. Maybe it fucking fell out of vogue, and that's why I can't find it. But I don't mm-hmm. know. I'd still like to know what that was. Oh, uh, fa- is it was some with fan, fan splaining? Like- it was fan splaining. Fan splaining. I'm pretty right. sure it was fan splaining. Let me see yeah. if that's right. Let me look that up. Pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Like, is it? Fa- uh, what? Well, 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 well. And then, you know, sometimes some gets. Well you're, well, you're finding that, TJ. We're moving on. Okay. Karate kid. Okay, TJ. yeah, it is fan playing. When a fan tries to explain something, oh, is this? No, that's that's from uh, that's from something else. Hold on. Ah, uh, you still don't have it, dude. I don't know if I have it actually. Well, whatever. What's that now? Now, we're talking about Karate Kid One here. Yes, the original karate. Oh, I know. I I bet you I know what this is. Okay, but before you do it, let me give me a second. Oh, you guys have a. If you guys have, well, Paul, if you don't know, I want to hear from you first. Do you think have you already heard this, or do you not know? It's not that I. It's not that I've heard it, but I've. There is a plot hole in this movie that I've noticed. I watched. So here's the thing about me and the Karate Kid. I've I watched the Karate Kid pretty much on an annual basis. Uh I'm Uh a huge fan of all these movies for whatever reason. Okay. So, um, so I, I think I know what the plot hole is. Okay. So I'm trying to think like, I, I like these, this movie. I'll tell particular. you what, Scotty, does the plot hole have to do with this very scene you're showing? Yes. Okay. okay. I know exactly what it, what it is then. Okay. Let's, let's see if Paul can get it. Um, does Daniel, you like limp on the wrong foot or something? Does the foot change that, that that's injured or some shit like that? I don't know. Nope. I haven't noticed it, whatever it is. Okay. Daniel breaks the rules of the fucking tournament. Yep. So his, using the crane his kick. last his yeah his crane. Okay, you're gonna tell him. Okay, go ahead. Using the crane kick, trained and perfected by Mr. Miyagi, Daniel Sutton knocks out Johnny and wins the tournament. Movie over, everyone cheers, and that, that's pretty much how the Karate Kid is. Like he kicks him in the fucking face and he wins. Except was this move legal? No. Nope. Should Daniel have been disqualified? Yep. Earlier in the film, it is said that, and this is a direct quote: "Hits to the face." Are not permitted. Not specifying whether this includes kicks. Machio himself called the crane cl- uh, the crane kick a clear violation, and the later YouTube series Cobra Kai ale- uh, features uh, it is alleged. Le- 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 uh, excuse me, it's alleged legitimacy as a prominent plot point. So I guess that's a big thing in Cobra Kai. I've wow. never seen Cobra Kai. Well, that's yeah. why TJ knew it. Well, he I do know that, but I, I knew that before. I mean, like this is a major plot hole in the movie. Like. If you watch this movie enough times, you're eventually going to be watching it and be like, wait a minute. See, I watched this movie. It's weird. When I go back and I watch this movie, and there's several other movies like that are real prominent in my childhood that are this way, I cannot not see them through the eyes of a child. Like, I have a very hard time turning my adult eye towards the Goonies and the Karate Kid and, you know, like some of the earlier movies that I'm, I was into as a kid. Like, 
when I watched this movie, that I, I know exactly why I missed that because it doesn't matter. He pulls off a badass, sweet fucking move at the end and wins. You know <laughs> I what I mean? Like that's, that's what it's about. It's a redemption story. The bully gets to be the bully for the last second. Uh, I saw um, away and blah, blah, blah. That's the, the whole point. Yeah, I, I love this movie. Um, the only movie that probably holds more of a nostalgic place for me than the, the Karate Kid is um, probably um, uh, uh, the Back to the Future movies. Those are my super nostalgic movies. Oh, yeah. But I still, de- those are definitely part of it. Like I don't really like Back to the Future three as much as I like one and two. And so I love three, the whole trilogy. But yeah. like the trilogy, I do too. I I like three, but I, I'd rather watch one or two any day of the week over three. <laughs> Yeah, uh, three's three's um, three might be the weakest. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll agree. With that. I don't know. You know it's hard I, for me not like I. Whenever I watch them, I watch them all like kind of like continuously. So to the point where to me they all just and they they perfectly fit in like they're not that way. Yeah. So I mean, like, I kind of just view them as one like but overarching you story. Too. You know. You have to acknowledge. And I think you guys have. So I'm not really saying, but maybe not necessarily you guys. But uh-huh. the nostalgia is such a big factor because I've shown these movies to other people. They were, you know, a little bit younger, and they're just kind of like, who cares? So it's definitely. A th- I don't think that's a hundred percent true because I showed Chelsea the Karate Kid, and she was like, she has z- anecdotes anyway. She has I'm zero nostalgia like, for it or whatever, more. but you know, she still it liked it. The movie, honestly, like it, it really does. Like sometimes, like I've, I've been um, watching a lot of movies with my girlfriend, who's quite a bit younger than me, so she hasn't seen a lot of the movies that I've seen. And you know, we watched The Godfather; it was her first time. Um, she'd only seen one or two Tarantino movies, so we're filling out the ones she hasn't seen. And she, you know, for the most part, I've found that if I like a movie, she tends to like it. But there have been some, like she didn't like, um, fucking what was it, uh, Hereditary? Like she thought it was just kind of boring and plotting and confusing and didn't really see but that's a contemporary movie so that's that can't even really be pinned on like nostalgia or something yeah that's just like any old movie that i've showed her that i like she's ended up like being like oh yeah that's a pretty cool flick well (laughs) we've seen yet again why anecdotal evidence is the worst kind (laughs) come on man i'll tell you what man karate kid is a fucking enduring classic and it will never die so that's all i gotta say on that I, i personally love the movie too but you know i bet a lot of people that don't well, okay. they're stupid people. Uh-huh. You know, there's stupid people in every generation. That's all I can say about that. How about Batman, TJ? Batman. Actually, his voice, he, he didn't really use that voice in this one. He was way more Clint Eastwoody. He was more like, you know, he was more whispery. I'm Batman. It wasn't until the next film that he started talking like this. Yeah, that was so. It's like why? Stupid. Oh, it's such a it takes a big old shit on that movie too. I just don't know why they dude, do that. It's like a, a franchise that gave the fucking gave Batman fans fucking hope, dude. When this yeah. movie came out, it was like holy shit. Batman yeah, it was good. I remember. Where are you? Here. Yeah. It's like oh shit, that was fucking crazy. Since chills down my spine just to think about it. Anyway, uh, plot hole. There's tons of plot holes in these movies. Honestly, these are not. They're not that strong in that regard. Um, I know there's a ton in Bat- I know there's a ton in the Dark Knight. I'm trying to think of what the major plot hole might be in Batman Begins. Uh, it's a, it's central to the plot. I will tell you that. So this yeah. isn't some like minor thing where it's like, oh, you know, there's some stupid mistake they make in the movie where they couldn't have possibly been in this location or something like that. It's it's bigger than that. Right. Gotcha. Um, big plot hole in Batman Begins. Okay. Um, I've heard a few of the Dark Knight ones about characters, like how would this character have known this, and you know that stuff kind of stuff. But uh, fuck, what's the what would the? Let me think here. Yeah, I really don't know. Um, this one to me, I don't know. It casts its spell pretty well, so whatever the plot hole is, I totally missed it. Okay, uh, Paul, you have any idea? I don't. Okay, so this is a direct quote from the movie, but well, you know, maybe removing an um or something. It uses focused microwave beams to vaporize the enemy's water supply. Direct quote from Batman Begins. Mm-hmm. So water pipes burst. Silver covers explode. <laughs> it's the fucking microwave emitter in action, TJ. Yeah. Yeah. Not seeing, a, not seeing the plot hole yet, TJ? I mean, is the plot hole that this device is absurd and would never fucking work? Because... Uh, it said if it did work, okay, so think about this, TJ. 
while the average percentage of water in a person's body is around 60%, the percentage can vary from roughly 43 to 75%. Uh-huh. So shouldn't everybody in the city have died when this device was triggered? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, probably. Boil. Not only yeah. that, but like... All the water. Not only that, but if they'd been... I, I actually remember another plot hole. Someone talked about this thing. Is like, if they'd been putting this in the water supply for that long and all you have to do to activate is vaporize it, then literally anytime someone's like boiling some water to make some fucking yes, yeah, pasta or right. something, it'd be, oh shit, I'm getting fear hallucinations, you know? So, I mean, like, yeah, that whole plot is pretty dumb. I didn't think it would be this because I thought this was like... This is just kind of something you have to accept. You know what I mean? Like, you're just expected to suspend disbelief on this one, I feel the like. MacGuffin. It's the MacGuffin of the film. It's right, like, the, you know. <laughs> you know, whatever. But yeah, that is a pretty glaring plot hole. It's. I mean, I can't. I can't really make an excuse for it. I'm not going to try to fucking all the water. It doesn't determine how, how, the device. You have to believe the device could determine the difference between a per the water in a person and the water in the fucking stream or whatever. Or the well. It's like, come on, that does that doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> it would vaporize the fucking most people. No, it, it makes zero sense at all. I mean, I'm not gonna fucking sit here and try to make excuses for it. I mean, you can if you like, but you're gonna fan splain this one away, TJ. I don't know if that is the term, but I'm gonna use it anyway because I'm it's convenient. So I'm not gonna fan splain this one. Uh, or whatever the proper term oh, yeah, is. There's that much shame. No, no, I'm just, but I mean, I, I'm just going to say like, this is really just an instance where you just have to suspend your disbelief because this thing is is stupid and you just have to fucking accept that it's stupid and just go with it. I never cared. I still like Batman. Because yeah, it's like, whatever. It's still a good movie. Like, all, most of these movies on this list, I don't really care about the plot holes. It's just, I like to reveal them because it's actually it was surprising to me. I, I was kind of like, oh, wow. But, but yeah, I mean, that's totally true. This thing, this thing is dumb as fuck for multiple reasons. Agreed. The plan is stupid. Uh, it's weird. Yeah. So how about this movie? Reservoir Dogs. Ooh. What yeah. is the plot hole in Reservoir Dogs? Now, Paul, you've watched this movie way I've more than it. I have. I've seen this movie like maybe twice, but I think only once. This movie casts a heavy spell over me, man. I love watching it. I've seen it a bunch of fucking times. I gotta. Hmm. This is the uh, Mexican standoff scene. Yes, it does. It does the plot hole involve this scene? It does. It does indeed. Okay. So somehow, okay. Does it have? To, does it have to do with how like Joe knows that he's a cop or whatever the fuck? No. Okay, I don't know. Then I have. Okay, a, can, can I make a? I don't know what the plot hole is, but can I make a prediction? Go ahead. Whatever the plot hole is, Paul is going to somehow come up with some elaborate reason why it's not a plot hole. Okay. Well, probably. Um, well, I mean, he What's could try, he can try to do that, but if you actually look at it, it's it's Quentin Tarantino even acknowledges the plot hole. Oh shit. Okay. okay. Uh, so near the end of Quentin Tarantino's debut film, Reservoir Dogs, you have essentially what is four people have guns on each other, in near simultaneous. Oh, like who shot Eddie? Yep, that's because it. Joe shoots fucking Mister Mister Pink. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna go through this. So all of them go off. Everyone falls to the ground. A dark, absurd ending to a dark, absurd film. That's what the, that's not my right. Opinion. But who shot who who fucking shot Eddie? Except nobody shot nice guy Eddie. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so guys, look, I have this ultra slowed down. Can you guys see this? Okay. Yeah. We have this ultra slowed down. And we're gonna watch it slowly. Okay. So yeah, Eddie's saying, "Take, don't point a gun at my dad." And then the guns go off. Nice guy Eddie looks like he shoots, um, uh, Mister uh, Fucking Orange. So I'll do it real slow again. So everyone yeah. Can okay. So uh, nice guy Eddie's got his gun trained. It looks like he's talking directly to Mister White here. But it, when it, the guns it, go off, first. so the boss fires first. So, right, Joe fires first and hits presumably Mr. White, who's in front of him. And nice guy. Ed, okay, wait. No, no, no. Joe. Okay, go go back. Roll, roll it back a little bit. This is pretty crazy. I'll go real slow. Right. So, yeah, real slow. And then pause it. Pause it right here. Okay, so Joe shoots first. It's hard to tell whether he has his gun trained on Mr. White 
or Mr. Orange, who's bloody and lying on the ground here. But it, Mr. Orange. But, it, but yeah, it looks like his bullet hits Mr. Orange due to the reaction. Okay, yeah, so here we go. Yeah. So, boom. His, yeah, his shot it, goes you off. You see it hit him boom. right there. Okay, so Mr. Orange gets hit. Now, nice guy Eddie shoots next. And it looks like his gun is trained on Mr. Orange as well, which is very strange. The angle is weird. But let's see who it hits. So it hits him. But uh, as you see, roll, it back, roll it back, roll it back. That that was weird. It's weird, but but everyone keep your eye on Mr. White's gun because he doesn't really move enough to shoot Eddie. Right. He's, yeah, he definitely does not shoot nice guy Eddie. <laughs> yeah, his guns never his gun never moves. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's the key. I watched it so many times so I could explain it to people. Yeah. Watch Mr. White's gun. The fact that it doesn't move enough to hit Eddie, but Eddie's blood packet still goes off and he's still I, I You know, I, I was wrong about Paul being the one to come up with a reason why this is okay. I have come up with a reason. Okay. Little thing called ricochet. Oh, so he hit the wall. That bullet bounced and done hit him. That's, that's what happened. Canonically, there's no other explanation. So, Fair enough. The bullet ricocheted. Uh, Apparently, Quentin Tarantino claims he was aware of this plot hole, but he just left it. So people notice that they have something to talk about or debate about. Like, well, he never really gets shot. He still dies. To be honest with you, at the freeze frame that we've got it right here, it is plausible that that bullet could have been, you know, somehow aimed at Eddie. Like it's pointed more towards him here than it is at any point in the gun. Well, the thing is, though, yeah, is that he's already he's falling hit before that happens, though. Yeah. So, like being shot. Like, go back to the moment when Eddie actually hit, gets hit. He swings the gun around and fires a couple of shots, and one of them hits Eddie. Maybe I don't know. Let's watch it one more time. Go back. Okay. Sure. Roll it back one more time. Sorry about right here. So it's three. Yeah. So they're talking. Don't point that fucking gun. Basically, don't point the gun at my dad. Oh, he shoots. It's Mr. Orange. Uh, what I want to see is what's going on at the moment Eddie's hit. Okay, the moment so, like, Eddie's hit. Let's find. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what's going on. Okay, so he fucking oh, he's hit here. He's hit there, and the guy's still no. It just doesn't oh, make sense. Wait. No, he's kind of swung around at this point. Look, mm. I mean, it if you look at him, if you go back and I'm saying you have to watch him. It looks like he's moving, but he's not moving. Is good enough to hit him for sure. Well, yeah, because okay. is... the because what's supposed to happen is he's supposed to shoot. Uh, the boss was to shoot Mr. Orange. He's supposed to shoot Eddie, and then I think he shoots the boss. Then, right, what was supposed to happen? But of course, you know he doesn't get. <laughs> Eddie just never ends up getting shot, but he dies anyways. So whatever, doesn't matter. Maybe he just. Maybe it's just like he sees everyone else falling down and dying, and he just figures he's going to do it too. Like, he feels you know? bad. He's like, you know what? I want to die too. He's like, I want to do this. And he just dies from shock. He's yeah. like, whoa. Yeah, he's just now, scared. This, one, uh, this next movie. May shock you guys, but it's actually I feel like that the, the filmmaker actually explains it pretty well. So another James Cameron one, Paul's favorite film, Aliens. There's a plot hole here, huh? There is a plot hole, but it's actually it was actually due to the theatrical cut of the movie. Okay. Oh, so is this is this okay, so this is like how does Newt or or like how does the fucking alien get into the facility and shit? Because I'm thinking, here's what was added in the not in the director's cut. There was a scene where Ripley, um, like, meets with a hologram of her daughter who's now dead, and has to like come to terms with the fact that while she was floating around in space, not aging, her daughter lived a full life and died of old age. Yeah. And so there's that scene. Um, and then there's the the shit with Newt and her family is really like heavily added in the in the director's cut. Like finding the fucking egg and then bringing it back and all that shit was cut from the theatrical version. So I'm trying to think of anything else that was. Mm. I can't think of anything at the moment. So um, I don't know. TJ, any idea? Uh, you know, I just watched this recently, but I watched the director's cut. So, so it would have made sense to you. So I mean, right. I don't. I guess the if it, if the loophole is only. I mean, sorry, if the plot hole is only in the theatrical, then I wouldn't know. It's been so long since I've seen the theatrical. The last few I times I've watched, watched it, will have to do with Burke. No, no, it doesn't have to do with the corporate guy. Uh, okay. no. All right, fair enough. Then. I can't remember what 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 was uh, excised from the theatrical that didn't make sense. So fifty-seven years after the events of Alien. 
Ellen Ripley is drawn back into another bloody battle against the fucking Xenomorphs. That's basically uh, that's that's basically the explanation of the movie. They 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 uh, form they set up a colony, <laughs> basically in, in Xenomorph fucking Topia, and Ripley has to save the fucking day again. Poor fucking Ripley. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's the plot hole. After the initial skirmish, it takes the aliens a really fucking long time to crawl into the ventilation shafts so they can infiltrate the colony headquarters from above. Right. Why didn't they just break the fucking doors down? Why, why didn't they just come in? Like, they could have easily just... We know the, the prowess of the aliens. We know their ability to get around. Okay, wait, what, okay, say that again. Okay, so after the initial skirmish, this is like the first time they encountered the aliens. Right. It takes they, aliens an absurd amount of time to crawl into the ventilation shafts so they can infiltrate the colony headquarters from above. Uh-huh. So it's like basically why didn't they just come kick the doors in? What's stopping them? What, what like what's taking them so long after that encounter to go in after the humans? Right. So, it, but is there a reasonable explanation for this? And the answer is is that the humans actually did leave protection, but it was so. This is what happened. They did. The scene was simply a victim of timing issues due to the theatrical cut, but it was reinstated for James Cameron's preferred director's cut, we, where we learn the Marines left automated sentry guns to mow down oh, the. Yeah. That's that's director's cut shit yep. during the abortive attack. So the okay. so they do leave sentries, but that was just cut from the film. So it does make sense if you see the director's cut. That's such a sentry. cool. That's such a fucking cool scene. Those auto guns going off and them tracking the amount of ammo and watching them get overrun. Like that's so cool. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. That I, I, I didn't remember that that wasn't part of the theatrical cut. That was my big issue here too. Is like I couldn't remember which was part of which cut, especially since I have. Uh, the last like couple of times I've watched this over the years has been the director's cut. Dude, look, let me explain something to you. If I'm watching a movie like the any of the Alien franchises, like Alien One, director's cut, Aliens, director's cut, I Alien mean, Three, I watch the director's cut. If there's, I, I mean, if if you're watching a movie and there's a director's cut available, I mean, I'm not gonna say a hundred percent of the time the director's cut is better, but usually it is. Like, like Kingdom of Heaven is a great example of that. I like, mean, Kingdom of Heaven, that movie ba basically goes from like a 5 out of 10 to like a 7 or 8 out of 10 just because the director's cut actually makes fucking sense. Yes. Like the theatrical cut is just gibberish. It doesn't even fucking like you're just like, huh? Like the character's motives don't even make sense until you see the real fucking cut of the movie. But yet again, fucking with their artistic vision really created this plot hole. So it's like, you know, I can't even really give James Cameron much shit about that. No, that was probably a fucking studio. That's probably an empty suit making that decision. Yeah. Him. This is a tough one because I really, I haven't watched the theatrical release of aliens in fucking probably two decades. You know what I mean? Like I watched it when it was all that was available, but ever since the director's cut of this film existed, that's been what I've watched and I've watched it way more times than I watched the original. So yeah, that's, that's a weird one. Yeah, just sad, too, because it really would not have added much to the fucking runtime to keep that shit in. It's not like a long ass scene with the auto guns, you know, no, but you know, you know how that goes. You know, Hollywood makes some uh, brilliant decisions. Uh, Hercules, TJ, there's all kinds of fucking plot holes in this. I don't even know what you're going to talk about. Um, uh, this is like a really big, a really big one. OK, uh, could you tell me what it involves so I can maybe give you like narrow it down a little bit? Um, cause I do know, I do know this movie pretty well and there are a few plot holes. Okay. The, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a way. I, I, if I tell you, it's just going to give it away. Oh, okay. Shit. Okay. Well, uh, let me think then. Could you maybe just tell me the character it involves or uh, Hades and Hercules, Hades and Hercules. Okay. Oh, is this the fucking, are you talking about the, the finale with the, the, the distance of the fucking pool of souls from the cliff face no. I, I mean i know there's a bunch but no not okay. even that because that one's fucking nuts like that's you, well, you can get into that one too after if you want no that one well it's it's not even that fucking hard to get like there's this big pool of like the the like the the souls of the dead that's just yeah. whirling around and like literally within the same scene it's shown being like fucking a hundred feet down in like one moment and then right next to the cliff face the next so it's like it just it makes zero sense it's totally like an incongruity that's like even like the stupidest little fucking kid watching this movie would would see it um well that is that is definitely one that's not the one we're talking about so hercules hades. and hades um 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, let me tell you. So, uh, Hades, king of the underworld, wants Hercules fucking dead. I want him dead now. Dead. D E D, dead. Mm -hmm. So he puts his best henchmen. Do you remember their names, TJ? Yep. Yeah, um, uh, isn't it Pain and Panic? I know one is named Panic. I think the other one's named Pain, but I could be wrong. Pain and Panic. You are right. Cool. So they're given the job. Voiced by. See if I can remember the actors who voiced them. I think one is Bobcat Goldthwait. Yes. And the other is. Fuck, I can't remember the other one. Matt Frewer. Yeah, I guess I I guess I don't remember uh, that person. He either. So they, they they take the job, they fail at the job, but they say, you know, let's tell Hades he's dead. And Hades believes them for quite some time. Of course we all know that they failed. They still want to go back and say, Hey, we didn't actually kill him. Mm -hmm. Uh Hercules may be super strong, but Hades is the king of the underworld. So why didn't you just double check that see if Hercules was actually there? Is he actually dead? Which he could have done. Oh yeah, that's true. Like he knows who's dead. <laughs> I never. Like knows who's dead. So. I'll be honest with you. I never. I never fucking. Uh, I never thought of that one. Why does he never like question why Hercules doesn't didn't show up in fucking hell? Especially since it's super crucial to his plans and all. Damn, that's pretty glaring. <laughs> yeah. So it makes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty glaring, but honestly, it never fucking occurred to me watching this, and I've noticed other plot holes in this movie, so. Uh yeah, that, but that is a good point. Yeah, that was just a childhood nostalgia. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that movie. I'm like, and I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, that does make a lot of fucking sense. Why did they? Why did Hades never check? He has this whole fucking crazy plot, but he can't bother to check. Like, he's dead, boss. Okay, let me go verify that. I could literally am the only fucking entity that can. <laughs> nope, I'm just gonna take their word for it. Oh yeah, don't trust your henchman. You're a super villain. I remember that. How about the Santa Claus? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the plot hole in this movie is that um, I, I'm trying to come up with a way of saying that this movie just shouldn't exist, but uh, I'm just going to say yeah, outright this movie this shouldn't movie exist. Is that somebody, the plot hole in this movie is that somebody funded it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the plot hole. See, uh, <laughs> That's the plot hole. According to the plot of reality, movies like that they're this stupid should not exist, but it, yet it does. So. Uh? Uh, no, this is a uh, this is a movie that uh, I remember like watching as a kid and uh, liking. I guess I did. I didn't like it. Really, I liked it as a kid. I went, I went and saw it with a uh, went and saw it with mom. I remember watching it as a kid, like oh it's Santa Claus, and um, you know. I, mean, I, think uh, I tried like to when it came out. Yeah, so. I tried to rewatch. I mean, I didn't believe in Santa Claus anymore, but I still, you know, I mean, it was still. I was still in the age range of this movie, and you know, I liked it. But uh, Paul was um, uh, like like seventeen or right, something. Right, so he's uh, yeah. This was name bullshit. I went and uh, you know, fucking years later, I'm like, yeah, I'll watch that again for the sake of nostalgia. And uh, nostalgia, the nostalgia goggles didn't do much for this one. It's awful. It's really unwatchable. Um. Uh? <laughs> So in one of the more morbid legal procedure based family films, the Santa Claus follows Scott Calvin, Tim Allen, as he accidentally kills Santa. Uh, <laughs> it's a job as the new Santa, thanks to a magical contracts clause. <laughs> so it's basically like, a, uh, yeah. yeah, I was nine years old when this movie came out, just for the uh, record, so. So, and it becomes a holiday tradition. He's Santa from now on. He gets to live his normal life, but through that the year, he becomes Santa Claus. Right. Okay. The, the best. The so, I will just say really quickly, the <laughs> best part of this movie is watching him slowly transform into Santa Claus. But uh, it's not. It's That's the like only. It. I wouldn't call it the best. It's the memorable part of this movie. Right. It's not. It's not really good. It's, it's not just, good. It's just the part you remember after you watch it. Yeah. Like, I'll, oh, yeah, I'll give you that, that part where he was getting fatter and his hair started to turn white. Right. Like, that's only like it's like five or six minutes worth of the goddamn movie. The yeah. rest of the movie is just bull honky fucking shit, dude. It sucks. Anyway, Sky, go ahead. Tell us what the plot hole is. <laughs> oh, dude, believe me, I have no problem. The guy shitting on this turd. Uh, <laughs> the film establishes that parents don't believe in Santa. Right. So there's, not, there's not any like, oh, we believe in Santa kids. Like, like <laughs> hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Scotty. 
<laughs> I just came up with a great fucking name for like a pro for a show. Shitting on a turd. <laughs> shitting on a turd. <laughs> shitting on a turd. <laughs> we just do it. We just make that our we, we, we watch bad movies and, <laughs> and then fucking shitting, right? on shitting on a turd, dude. <laughs> Let's shit, shitting on a turd. Shitting on a turd might seem right, absurd. I'll tell you what, it did clog the toilet too. Uh, yeah, you're just not supposed to shit on a turd. <laughs> hey, man, you, you, sometimes you gotta go, dude. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you gotta fucking go. Double no down. Choice. Double down. All right. Uh, so, so the yeah. film establishes for like parents don't believe in Santa. Just parents like, don't believe in Santa Claus, right? And yet, the film presents as objective fact that Santa is real. Yep. So on Christmas morning, when kids open presents from the real Santa, whom parents don't believe in, what do they think? You know, this is a this is a flaw. In a, this is actually a plot hole in way more than just this movie. There's tons of movies where it depicts the parents as not really believing in Santa. Every Santa, every Santa movie. Every yeah. Santa movie has this flaw from Miracle on fucking 31st Street to fucking any movie with Santa in it has this plot hole. Any Well, not any movie with Santa, because there's some movies with Santa where the parents do believe in Santa. But if okay. there's a if there's a movie where the if there's a movie that depicts adults as not believing in Santa, but there really is a Santa, which is most Santa yeah. movies. Every one of those point. movies has a giant plot hole at the heart of it, like Elf. Makes no sense. Right. None of those movies make any sense. Made these toys, but none of these people believe in Santa. Where do these toys come from every goddamn fucking year then? Yeah, this is uncritically accept that hey, uh some entity is leaving these presents behind, but it's definitely not it's Santa. Definitely not Santa. <laughs> it's like, all right. I uh, guess I think the government delivers them or something. The government yeah. breaks your house and leaves the, what your kids wanted. I don't know. Yeah, so uh, this plot hole goes well beyond this movie, but yeah, I've noticed that plot hole before. Not not specifically in this, but just in cri- a bunch of Christmas I movies. Mean, I had a lot of them where Santa like sprinkles magical like dust on the parents to make them like forget that he's the one that left the fucking toys or whatever. I seem to remember this scene where like. The parents are like, wait a minute, it's been you that's been buying. And then like, he's like, shing, you know, like bang, he puts, throws like dust in their face. And then they're like, oh, let's go to bed. Yeah, that might just be something that my fevered age and drug use addled brain concocted completely out of. Whole cloth. <laughs> I don't well, know. I feel like that might have been in. I don't think that was in this movie, but I feel like there might be a movie where that has been shown. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like a shared delusion at this point because I kind of remember that happening in a movie too, but I can't place the movie, so maybe it's another one. <laughs> I think Paul might have just implanted this in our heads, though. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to you. Virus to you somehow. <laughs> it's all right, dude. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> Paul, the brain eating amoeba. I just incepted a terrible idea that's going to lead <laughs> to all of our doom. I'm sure you guys are shocked to hear that Star Wars left a pretty big fucking plot hole. Um, there's yeah, a, there's more than one. There's more than one in this one too. But um, yeah, uh, well, there's a ton, of course. I mean, there's a, we're limited to just one, of course, uh, tonight. But, so I'm assuming yeah, that you we must have. To, a, all right, yeah, go ahead. Let us let us know. This is not to say that there are not other plot holes in the Star Wars prequels. So, and I think you guys all agree with this. The Skywalker twins are separated at birth, so that Darth Vader may never find his extremely force sensitive children. And turn them to the dark side. Right. Makes sense. It makes sense, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, no, it actually, I mean, well, the way they do it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, but that's the problem. Why then are they kind of put into this, you know, Jedi witness protection program, but Leia gets a new name, family, home, when Luke doesn't get shit? Luke, they don't even change his name. It's like, you're Luke Skywalker, and we're putting you back with your family that your father definitely knows about. Yeah, like, like why let me, fan explain. let me fan explain a little bit. Okay, go I ahead. Well, let's finish it then. You can fan explain because I want to hear all the points. Uh, she's placed in the care of Bail Organa and his well off family, the Aldron royalty. Luke, meanwhile, is dropped off in the desert to live with the remaining family members of Anakin's family on their moisture farming homestead. He even keeps the Skywalker name and somehow lives relatively undisturbed. Okay. So you want the fan splain now? Is, well, well, is, is it going to be more. some form of like, it's always in the last it's place not, you look? The hiding place makes no sense since Vader undoubtedly remembers where his family, only living family resides. But that's why he'd never think to look there. Yeah, it doesn't even hide Luke's identity. It doesn't even hide his identity. He goes back 
to the same planet that Anakin Skywalker is from. And he keeps okay. Okay. the same name. Here's here's your fan explain. You ready? Yeah. Anakin does not want to go back to Tatooine because of what happened there. He when he killed all the fucking sand raiders and shit because they killed his mom. He remembers that shit. And he's like, that's a it's it's like a, it's like a mental block in his mind. He 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 can't he can't it's a blind uh, spot in the force. Yoda and the other Jedi Council who are responsible for hiding the Skywalker twins <laughs> okay. knew that Vader had that painful memory there because they knew his past. They had seen him and worked with him and trained him as a Padawan, so they knew. And they knew that he would be force blind to that spot. And they had to they had to take them to different types of places. They couldn't hide Leia at the top of a family and then let that treachery betray both children. And so Luke was placed at the meagerest of means at a backwater planet that only existed as a faint and repressed memory in the mind of Anakin. And uh, of course, the Jedi being wise in the ways of the force would know this. I mean, come on, guys. This is fucking super simple. Dude, the amount of fucking apologetics and sophistry you tried to concoct. No, dude, no. That was not sophistry. That was just straight up explanation uh, of uh, clearly uh, defined plot points. You, you, you've you gone so <laughs> far off what we actually know about those characters and their motivations. That, like, yeah, if, you, if you're real, allowed to rewrite the story entirely, you can make it fit in some don't way. You remember, don't you remember when Yoda was like, the boy we will hide on Tatooine? <laughs> and they were like, Tatooine? Master Yoda, that's ridiculous. That's where that's where Anakin is from. That's Vader is from Tatooine. And he says, mm, yes, much pain masks that place for him. <laughs> I love my Paul's ego. Great. <laughs> Safe, Luke. Sorry, and dial, additional dialogue to make the plot <laughs> make sense. Paul's ego. They, well, the problem is they had to cut that from the theatrical cut because it's for length. You know, exactly. So. But I, but I, but I went up to Skywalker Ranch and Luke let, or uh, sorry, not Luke. That's what he likes to be called when you're at Skywalker Ranch. <laughs> when you're at Skywalker Ranch, he makes you call him Luke Skywalker. But um, <laughs> yeah, when I was up there, he showed me the real cut, and it's a great scene. It's a heart wrenching scene. Wow. Much pain there is for Anakin there. Go there, he will not. His mind allow it will not. <laughs> The force blinds him to that pain. Oh, yeah. All right. I've heard about this scene. I've heard about this scene. <laughs> All right, Paul. So what's your explanation for this one? Besides okay. uh, making Leia the adopted daughter of a famous political figure isn't uh, particularly sensible either. Um, Hiding in plain sight. I mean, if she's a powerful adopted political figure, I mean... Vader's not going to be, you know, he's going to think they placed her on some, you know, off world or some weird place that it's hard to find. He's not going to be looking at the tops of the families. You know what I mean? So Vader in, the, in this story now is reduced to just an idiot. They can't think of like where to look besides like, I don't know where to look. I'm confused. Although there's tons of these noble families and planets and shit. I mean, come on. Yeah, they, there's a shit was waiting for when the moment was right. They put Leia Organa with people that they knew were uh, loyal to the light side of the force and wouldn't, you if know, you say anything that like, here, here's, I think is, is a more sensible thing that Vader knows where they are and doesn't care. He's waiting for them. And ultimately that he believes that the force that they will come to him. Well, that's what he says. Like, I mean, he basically tells Luke as much and, and so does the emperor. He, he, they talk about how it was destined. You know what I mean? It is your destiny to be here today. It's like they foresaw. I have foreseen it. So they knew some of this shit was going on. So you could even say that you could say like, okay, Vader knew that he had to allow his children to develop so that he could, uh, you know, let find out which one of them. Number one is the most powerful, which he did. He put Luke through the more rigorous test. And Luke is clearly the more powerful force sensitive than, than Leia is. Even if you go with the retconning of the fucking, you know, uh, sequels. Sure. Um, and then he's trained as a Jedi and shit. I mean, look, what's easier? Vader shows up and just kills his son and has no protege. Or Vader allows his son to be trained in the ways of the Jedi, but makes it hard for him along the way and weakens him psychologically so that he can eventually break him and turn him as a powerful ally without having to have reveal his plan till the very end, you know, like it's, you know, it, it works. 
Why would he? Why would he go intercede when he knew that he, he was creating a powerful ally in, in Luke? Well, we can make as many explanations as we want. There are still, unfortunately, I can say many to be considered glaring plot holes. And now the final one. Let's see if you guys know it. Is it in the same movie? Oh, no, it's not in this movie. The final, the final one of this. Oh, I thought it's maybe the guys- final plot hole. I thought of one earlier. And now I'm because I'm a stoner. I can't remember what it was, but I was like, I'm I'm not gonna mention this because we're because we're gonna fucking probably cover it. No. Oh. <laughs> you guys know now. Yeah, I already know it. Fucking the Eagles. Use the, the Eagles. Use the Eagles. This is, this is the one that will never die. And this oh, is this also is- the one that fanboys like Paul like have the same. Oh my god, it's gonna be so. Oh, no, no, no. no. I, I have actually actually pulled something from a fanboy that I'm going to read. Oh, thank God. Time. It'll spare me having to listen to Paul actually do it in I real might life. Have a different fucking explanation. No, fanboy, no, all you fanboys have the exact same explanation for this shit. So, so let's all look right. here, TJ. The eagles of Gossendror only were summoned once the eye of Sauron was... It's like, shut up. You guys are such faggots. Ugh, this movie it's sucks so bad. They're not actually working, so fuck them. Yeah, fuck it. Oh. <laughs> they're so gay. All right, well, I'll give you my version of it then. Okay. Oh, no. Well, no, no I'm not talking about these images. Oop, let's go back. Yeah, what was wrong with them images, Scotty? Why aren't they working? What's going Mostly on working, here? But, hey, we're just going to have these images. For you now. know what the real plot hole of this movie is? We never do see these two finally fuck. And I was waiting for it that whole time. It's a beautiful thing, TJ. It's like, when are they going to fuck? Sam and the Froadster. Look at them frolicking. They were fucking, trust me, they shared the load, TJ. I know. know, I'll I'll tell you what. Every single one of my criticisms of this movie would vanish if it would have just shown those two fucking. Well, let's fucking hear it, TJ. So when the Eagles are used... To rescue Frodo and Sam from mm-hmm. the side of Mount Doom, mm-hmm. it brings on the serious question of why weren't they just used to bring them there in the first place? Mm-hmm. The distraction caused by Aragorn at the gates would still have been necessary, but Frodo and Sam risking life and limb over the course of three films definitely wasn't. So here's the fucking... Could have all got home a lot question. sooner. Okay, TJ, so here it is. Okay. Reason number one. That would have been a bad story it was not what Tolkien was interested in telling. That's bullshit. That's a that's a bullshit. Uh-huh. One. Mine is way better. Reason number two. It was tactically undoable. The Eagles were only able to enter Mortar after the ring is destroyed. Uh-huh. Also bullshit. From the top of Baradur. That's the one so I've heard a million times. The Eagles coming from miles away. When they were within reach of him, he would have brought down uh, brought them down with arrows or magic. The Nazgul were able to fly on their fell beast and also been able to intercept the eagles. Okay, the this eagles, one is actually this excuse me, Paul, excuse me, Paul, I'm bringing an explanation here. If the eagles, Paul, were to get to Mordor and evade those aerial attacks, Frodo would still have had to get the ring to Mount Doom. The top of the volcano is not a wide open lava target, Paul. To get to the heart of the cracks of doom, the eagles would have had to land, then let Frodo and Sam or Aragorn walk the rest of the way up. You know what? Ex- Good fucking point because it's like they encountered no opposition on the ground, right? Well, that's because that's because Mordor had been emptied to face Aragorn's army at the gates of Barad-dur. I was being sarcastic. These motherfuckers encountered about a billion things trying to kill them on the ground. So the idea, no. like, there was stuff trying to kill them in the air, so that's why they couldn't do that. Only it's like there was plenty towers. of shit on the ground trying to kill them. We could have been done in one fucking movie. They get on the eagles. They do some cool aerial fight scene shit. They go in. They throw the ring in the fucking lava. Roll credits. I'd have been out of there in 90 minutes. Just enough time to eat my popcorn. I could have fucked off and never thought about it again. Instead of it being some epic fucking trilogy of bullshit. That every fucking moron on earth has to defend me every time I dare to criticize it. Boo! I have got the perfect fucking explanation for this. It's completely different from all the other ones that were off. Some of those were weak. Some of those were okay. I do agree that without the diversion at the gates, just having the guys fly the Eagles in definitely wouldn't have fucking worked. You know what I, I could mean, have Mordor done? I'll tell you what. Than that. Here's what you do. Here's the real way you do it. You just show the Eye of Sauron, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and when he falls the fuck asleep, then you sneak in and throw the ring in the lava. No, fair enough, TJ. We all know you think these movies suck, but let me give you the actual explanation as to why they couldn't just magically poof 
or fly fucking Frodo to the or anybody. Why why even involve Frodo? Mm -hmm. It's because you didn't pay attention to the story that you think that this is a plot hole. The the in order for you to get rid of the ring, you must make the choice standing at Mount Doom to drop it into the fire. Mm -hmm. In order to truly make the choice, you must not only just possess the ring, it must possess you as well. Is Sealdur failed this test? You remember in the, you know, uh, Hugo Weaving's character says cast it into the fire and he turns around and Sildur says no. Mm hmm. And that's in the fellowship of the ring right the day of the strength of man right man, right man, so man. here's the thing is sildur had to possess the one ring for long enough to know its power and make the choice to throw it into the fire the reason that frodo is chosen is because his race is particularly resistant to the temptations that the ring offers. The hobbits are not power hungry people as a rule. And he comes from a particular line of hobbits that's shown to be trustworthy and adventuresome. So somebody has to be the martyr. Somebody has to carry the ring long enough to really truly understand its burden and then be faced with the choice to cast it into the fire. And Frodo fails as well if you remember he does frodo is not capable of throwing the ring into the fire either no. it is Gollum, in his lust for the ring which he also possessed for years and years so he knew the choice he was making too that in trying to get the ring falls into the lava with it and thus completes the fucking journey he makes the choice to destroy the ring with the cost being wearing it one final time. Yeah, just one last brief possession of it. That is why you cannot just fly the ring to Mordor and chalk it down the fucking hole of the volcano because it wouldn't destroy the ring otherwise. The ring has to be destroyed by somebody who knows, who possesses it, and, and who it possesses. They, it has to be a choice. It cannot be destroyed. If it was, if it was able to be destroyed by lava, then let's, get, let's fuck the plot hole right here. When Gimli strikes it with his fucking hammer. No, it just, it can, but they specifically it, say it can only it be destroyed in the fire, fires of Mount Doom. They never say anything about it has to be cast in by someone who the ring also because that was never it's set two. up as a criteria. No, they don't. No, they don't. Yes, they no, they do. fucking don't. When do they say that? Who can bear this burden? When does it who fucking can, say that? Who amongst us can bear this burden? And they know what that burden means. That burden means that by the it time it never says it, they're, they're saying who could fucking they're possibly carry. No, 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 no. You're conflating two different oh, things, oh, sir. Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. Oh, what a load of shit. What a load of bullshit. No. They were saying that only fucking a hobbit could carry the ring to Mount Doom because anyone else would be corrupted by it. It never Almost says that a person way. has to be possessed by the ring in order for the ring to be destroyed. It only says the ring must be cast into the fires of Fount Mount Doom where it was fucking forged. It doesn't really matter who carries it there. It's just that only Frodo was innocent enough and naive enough to not be corrupted by the ring's fucking power. Right. And even that wasn't true because as you said, he was. But if he just was able to fly there real quick on an eagle, lickety split, toss that exactly. motherfucker in and go about his business, there wouldn't have been time for the ring to fucking corrupt him. And we could have been out of there in 90 minutes so after eating our popcorn. Is, your contention is you spent all of your life hearing about this film and you don't like the film. You didn't like watching them, right? What's that? What? I said your contention. I've is seen the these movies way more times than I wanted to. Shit about not liking the films. Yeah. I mean, you've been watching them, right? This movie sucked dick. Yeah. Okay, so well, the time you've spent endlessly browsing, never find anything to watch. I mean, you've wasted so much time in your life. Like those movies, at least gave you something in return, TJ. Even if it was a bunch of bullshit, even if it was, those movies sparked some passion, TJ. You otherwise would have been listless, sitting around fucking picking fucking belly button lint and fucking bitching. Oh, yeah, yeah. should we browse endlessly? This fucking film gave you something, TJ. I it, let, let, let me walk through TJ's fucking like thought process here. So let's say, okay. At, in the very first movie, you remember when mm -hmm. fucking, um, Gandalf shows up and he's like, is it secret? Is it safe? And Frodo still has the old ring. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And your contention is why didn't Gandalf just summon the fucking Eagles to Hobbiton 
load up fucking Frodo, who's resistant to it, because you remember Gandalf won't even touch it. Right, because it would corrupt him. Right. Um, so for, he loads up Frodo and Sam on a couple of eagles, gives them a vanguard, and sends them directly at Mordor, right? This is your contention. This is what should have happened. Uh, maybe not from that location, but probably when the council of people met to discuss what oh, to do about it. Here's what there, had yeah. to happen in order for that to be a possibility, because you may think it's a neck beardy fucking argument, but there's no way those Eagles are flying into Mordor unless there's an army at the gates of Mordor that needs every fucking orc and every beast in Mordor and every Nazgul mm-hmm. at attendance. Yeah, it's suicide. Otherwise they, they Mordor's border bor, Mordor's borders are very <laughs> securely protected. In fact, the path that, uh, fucking, uh, Sam and fucking, uh, Frodo used to get in is literally fraught with the most insane danger ever. And it's one of the only ways into fucking Mordor. They had to be in Mordor by the time this happened, because there's only so long that they were going to be, they knew that it was a losing battle at the gates. The, the, they knew that without the ring being destroyed, without breaking the power of the ring, they were going to lose at the front gates of Mordor. So Sam and fucking Frodo had to already be in Mordor when the army showed up. And not only that, but all of those nations, which were almost at war, had to be united under one banner in Aragorn to be brought to the gates in the first place to get the diversion to so that two little hobbits can slip in and throw the fucking ring in the fire, TJ. Yeah, mm-hmm. they had to go behind enemy lines, TJ. There's mm-hmm. absolutely no way that happens. Those eagles get shot out of the air or snatched out of the air by Nazgul and eaten as a snack, and the ring falls right back into the hands of the fucking dark. The Lord writers can the, make the writers can make literally whatever they want to happen. Right, but you're not the filmmakers can make whatever they want to happen. They can fucking write it however they want. They can write it however they want. Frodo, they can write a movie where Frodo literally just takes the ring in his hands and snaps it in half like a twig and says, well, that's that. You haven't read the books. You're looking at it mm-hmm. with no fucking context. You don't know the stories. You don't care. And so you just, you're just like, yeah, what did you fly it in? Fucking Mordor is a fortress. Mm-hmm. It's literally teeming. Its entire border is mm-hmm. teeming with mercenaries, orcs, and Nazgul. There are stations all around its borders. The gates of Mordor are depicted in the movie exactly as they are. The walls are in unclimbable. The gates impenetrable. Manned by the fucking most vicious and elite of fucking Sauron's hordes. There's no way a bunch of birds are going to fly some dumpy ass hobbits in there. It's and an impregnable like, fucking fortress, dude. Power? You, are you fucking stupid? They flew like, them in there at the fucking end of the movie. And I'll tell you why this plot hole exists. I'll tell you why this plot hole exists. I'll tell you why this plot hole exists. Because every single person that had to fucking slog through these miserable fucking movies, once they saw those eagles, they're like, wait a minute. If these eagles would have flown them in at the beginning, we could have fucking bypassed all this shit. And you know what? Every single one of those people, absolutely right. <laughs> fucking who cares? I don't care what it says in the books. I don't care about the fucking deep, rich history and that bullshit. All I know is we could have had a 90-minute movie with eagles fighting uh, an aerial battle defending. against the Nazgul, and then it, it could have been 90 minutes, just enough time for you to eat your popcorn and fucking There's go the fuck home. If the film had been 90 minutes, TJ would have been in a fucking disgrace. And no, it already it. was. At least it would have only been a 90-minute disgrace, and that's my oh, final word on that. Okay. There's you know, politics to play. TJ, there's fucking politics at play that uh-huh. you're not even a fucking aware of. These eagles are not just willing servants of any man who comes to them. Like, they don't. They could be written as whatever you want to be. They don't. Well, whatever, then. <laughs> then, there, then no plot hole exists ever, and you've reduced everything to the whim of whatever. Like, you're you're the one arguing that there's a giant plot hole here. I don't even, I don't even care if it's a plot hole at this point. Maybe it's not a plot hole. I mean, it's constantly brought up as a plot hole, but I know that it's constantly argued about whether or not it is. But I'll tell you this, whether it's a plot hole or not, it's a better movie. That's all I this know. Is a bullshit plot hole. It's easily defensible if you've read the books or even just watch the movies. You don't even have to read the books. If you watch the movies and watch how a things unfolded and how the plan unfolded from the start, how Gandalf set in motion what eventually became the unification of the humans and the dwarves and the elves so that they could muster an army large enough to distract fucking Sauron for fucking just long enough for somebody to slip behind enemy lines and destroy the ring. Like, you don't even have to pay attention all that close to know that that's what's going on. 
if they could just fucking fly eagles into the fucking Mordor, it wouldn't be very secure, would it? They could probably just climb the walls and do it themselves. Like, this place is not penetrable. It's not a fortress that you just fly an eagle into and drop things into a fucking hole. <sighs> and if that's, a ba- if, that, if that's a plot point that you think is boring or stupid or whatever, then that's fine. I can't change your mind on that, but to say it's a plot hole is fucking stupid. I am going, uh, yeah, well, whatever. I'm not the one who called it a plot hole. Sky's the one who brought it up as being a plot hole. Sure. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard this is the weakest fucking plot hole yet. Because it's really not one. I mean, like, like look, look at it from a pragmatic perspective. Well, I mean, look, there's always two sides. At least two, usually, the two sides to everything. This is definitely an issue where a lot of people. I mean, Clerks too famously did the whole fucking thing where it's like the movies are just about walking. It's boring. Throw the fucking ring in. The fucking use the eagles. I mean, look, we've heard this. I mean, I've read fucking, entire fucking articles title. about why the fucking eagles couldn't be used in this situation. So I know this fucking argument inside and out. It's but I mean, easy like, peasy. It's this, not a hard argument uh, to understand either. The Eagles are not going to just fucking get into Mordor without a distraction. You're not going to get a distraction big enough without unifying all the other races on the fucking planet. And having somebody already on the inside when that happens. I mean, so you could have t- you could have written to Mount Doom, which is briefly unguarded because the eye is, you know, watching this big battle and throw it in like that's the plan. The plan is not. Like that, it just wouldn't work. Like I mean, you're, yeah, also, I, guess, uh, I mean, you could write a totally different plot where they fucking have some other distraction that enables, or some other MacGuffin that allows the Eagles to get in. Yeah, Whatever. No, the story beautifully talks about different cultures coming together and reunifying against an, an an enemy, and fucking all of the shit that goes on on the side while that's happening that facilitates Frodo and Sam. We so, check in with all of the characters as they go on their different fucking crazy voyages see, to try and unify. All at the heart of this planet, at the heart of this debate really is this. Some people want to spend a lot of time in Middle Earth and some people don't. And the people who don't would have rather seen them do this fucking shit quick. And I'm uh, one of those people. And that's just I, where I, the fuck I'm at. Any sense to make movies that way. Like, why would you make like a 90 minute telling of three books? And TJ, originally, by the way, you uh, almost got your wish to it in a sense because originally this was pitched as two movies, but then one of the studio executives, in a surprising moment for a studio executive, but obviously more of just a crass money based one, is like, "There's three books, so why not three films?" Well, and dude, I, I think uh, from a financial made perspective, one. he made one of the greatest decisions okay. ever, so I can't yeah, deny that. If it was made now; it would have been fucking nine fucking movies. Oh my god, yeah, they would have been like this. They, they still be they, they'd still be telling this story. I mean, if it, if they did it now, they'd probably just do it as a fucking TV show, like fucking Game of Thrones or something, and just fucking keep this. Sh- we'd probably be half. It. We'd probably be halfway through the story, and you know, I mean, like whatever. Uh, let me really like fucking piss you off, TJ. These movies should have been longer. Uh, there's par- I mean, there's already super long versions of these movies. No, 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 no. They should have been long. There, there is a whole really important part of these films excised. Even, even from and like the nine hour director's cut. cuts? Sau- no. Yeah. Sauron in the books is chased out of uh, Isengard, not killed. That was retconned for the movie. He is not killed in Isengard. He is, he's chased out of Isengard by uh, the tree, the treants and shit, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, While so- the rest of the movie goes on, he and Grima Wormtongue make their way to the Shire. Oh, yeah, you're right. Under disguise. They take new names and they set in motion the subjugation. It's called the scouring of the Shire by the time. Okay. So Frodo leaves at the end, right? Because he's so fucking touched by the ring. Right. Can't hang around anymore. He's got to go somewhere else. The other hobbits go home expecting to, you know, be welcomed into open arms and they find an industrialized nightmare where the hobbits have basically been enslaved to this corporation that fucking Sauron has set up with warm tongue as it's, figurative head and they have to fight they have to like rouse the hobbits and fight a final battle against uh i'm sorry not sauron saruman i, I, I always get a mix mixed up they're very close saruman so the the you know the the christopher lee wizard. yeah gotcha. oh, yeah dude christopher oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah Galen went over this shit with me before too about how this should have been included. So yeah, there's this whole uprising where Merry and Pippin have to like rouse the fucking hearts of the hobbits and convince them that they're not living in a great world and they have to fight against this industrialized fucking exploitation of the Shire and return it to its beauty. And they do it. They rouse the hobbits. The hobbits kick fucking uh, Sauron out of uh, out of Hobbiton. And it's like a, it's like a little mini version of the story told again at the end. It's great. And it's just completely cut. <laughs> it's great. It doesn't sound great. Like it, it really is because Mary and Pippin in the books, like they're remembered in later works of Tolkien that happen after the Lord of the Rings as heroes of the Shire. Like, you know, they're, 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 they're on paintings and they're told about in stories and shit. And the reason for that is because they rose up and, you know, led this rebellion against. Well, maybe they can do a sequel uh, where that happens. <laughs> I don't fucking won't. know. It should have been in the goddamn movies, but people are all against having movies that are over four hours or over three hours or whatever. It should have been in the fucking goddamn movies because it's great. It's a great ending. It's way better than the fucking weird. Like he just sails off into the distance right. and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, our, our episode is almost approaching fucking Lord of the Rings movie length at this point. So good. Good. So I'll say one, la- one last thing. Man, yeah. but, uh, I hope when uh, you find out hell is real. Lord of the Rings. Maybe. It probably will be. It probably yeah, fucking will be. I hope my hell is Lord of the Rings. I want to go to hell if that's the case. I'd watch them fucking, I watch. I'm gonna go. You know what, dude? I'm gonna go watch the movies tonight. I'm gonna start. Good, good for you. Go fucking watch that. Yeah. And you know, it might be. I mean, that's true. It might be good as a sleep aid. That's about only thing that is good for. Hey, you know what you did? And start watching. I'm gonna buy them long versions too. Them extra long super directors deluxe cut. With that fucking extra hour of footage, of you know, I've thought about doing like a that. fucking like really fucking in depth deconstruction of these movies, but I realized if I did that, I'd have to end up watching them over and over and over again, and I don't want to do that. So, you, I think you're afraid of what you might find. I think you might find that you actually like these movies, and that nope. your opinion is just an edge lord anti Scotty opinion that's morphed into a fucking <laughs> bullshit opinion that doesn't really bear any fucking fruit. TJ, join us. Is it secret? You know, you, you, you it know that if you watch these films, you might be forced to concede that they're actually really fucking good. I've seen them plenty. All right. Fairly well, y'all. I hope you enjoyed. See you next time with more Deep Fat Fried. 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 Deep fat fried.